Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Uh, his work on EWTN and other places. Uh, but he is really here, in my mind, uh, because of his affection for his work with Father Harvey, uh, going almost to the back, back to the beginning of, uh, of the apostolate. And so he brings with him, uh, of course, a wonderful Christian anthropology, all of the clinical experience, which is so important to the work of courage. And he brings with him, too, that affection for Father Harvey, as, of course, Father Groeschel also, and, and Cardinal Burke, uh, who knew him from uh, uh, many, many years ago, bring to us today. And this is part of our uh, desire in this conference, was to honor the memory uh, of our uh, founding director, our founding father, and that's one of the reasons why we've asked Dr. Fitzgibbons to speak. Dr. Fitzgibbons. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here with you this morning. I'm speaking after St. Father Grishel. <laughs> reminds me of so many conferences in which I would speak after St. Father John Harvey. <laughs> and I carry his card with me uh, and say a little prayer to him every day. It's a great pleasure being here with you and to encourage meetings. Uh, one comes here somewhat drained in the battle and finds oneself energized and strengthened. Um, one of my favorite passages from the Old Testament, a brother strengthened by a brother or a sister, is like a fortified city. So it's very strengthening to be here. While the topic I've chosen is mastery and self-giving, self-mastery, which comes from John Paul II, who stated that, that self-mastery is essential to self-giving. And he wrote in Faith and, Respo Faith and Reason, it is in faithful self-giving that a person finds a fullness of certainty and security. So when we give ourselves, we image in the sacrament of marriage, we image God in some way, as John Paul II writes, and we even become an icon of the Trinitarian love, a flow of love uh, between a husband and a wife. I'd like to begin this uh, talk by um, just saying a brief part of St. Augustine's prayer to the Holy Spirit. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that all my thoughts may be holy. So I would like to um, talk initially about my relationship with Father John Harvey, truly an extraordinary man. Um, I first met him in 1979. For me, he was an incredible spiritual father, I mean, a, a mentor, um, a remarkable, remarkable instrument that God chose to bring in to the midst of extraordinary darkness, extraordinary darkness. Um, Dale O'Leary, who's a major writer with, which had been the Vatican delegation at Beijing and Cairo and with the Catholic Medical Association, stated one day that Church historians may look, go back upon this history and view it as a history of the great sexual heresy within the church, the great complicity in this heresy about Christ's true teachings on sexual morality. So in 1979, I met Father Harvey for the first time, and I was three years out of my training in psychiatry, and the vicar for clergy in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, then Monsignor Galante, now Bishop Galante of Camden, would have monthly meetings for mental health professionals. And somehow in those meetings, I may have brought up that I'd been seeing some males with homosexuality, uh, certainly not my particular specialty. Most of my work involves, um, with men, involves issues surrounding male confidence. That is, in most of the problems with men with anxiety, substance abuse, depression, pornography use, relates to male confidence issues which is the primary problem numerous studies have demonstrated in the homosexual lifestyle. Large studies, 7,000 adults in the Netherlands, 10,000 teenagers in England this year. So at that meeting, um, I met him for the first time and was extremely impressed. This gentle, quiet man who just proclaimed the truth, gently, quietly. I was, in 1979, totally naive about what was going on. I was in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, was led by John Cardinal Kroll. We were protected. I mean, we were really protected. If someone stepped out of line, <laughs> eternal correction, goodbye. You know, there was no problem. It's like in a family. Like I have 
<clears throat> three daughters, and the most common thing I correct in my daughters is the most common thing I correct in my patients. Selfishness. Selfishness is the major enemy of marital love. It is the major reason why priests have left the priesthood over the past 40 years. It is the core reason why priests abused, sexually abused adolescent males. Selfishness. Acting against one's very nature as a man, to be a protector, and one's anointing as a priest to be ontologically conformed to Jesus Christ. So um, with Father Harvey, I then began having a wonderful opportunity to talk to him, to turn to him, to call him regularly. Father, I've got a challenging person I want to run by you. He would reciprocate. We would share different histories and about people who were trying to help. In 1995, we uh, gave a conference, two one-day conferences, for the priests of Allentown, Pennsylvania. They were required to attend. It was called, the priest called it Gay Day. And he spoke about the church's teaching, and I spoke about the origins of homosexuality and approaches to healing. And we would go back and forth in this area and supporting one another. In the, about 1987-89, it became clear to me, my eyes were opened slowly to what was occurring in the church. It was occurring particularly in the treatment centers for priests and religious. That is, the priests and religious who went to these treatment centers were by and large told, God made you that way, try to live with it, plus minus. So I thought, well, we have Father Harvey here with tremendous wisdom. Let's propose a treatment, a boutique, a treatment program within a program called the John, Father John Harvey Treatment Program for Sexual Addictions. We'll put that into the treatment program for priests in the treatment center outside Philadelphia. And so we met with the director of the um, program several times, and of course the idea was rejected. However, in Philadelphia, we are now dancing in the streets because we have a new archbishop, Archbishop Chapu. And it occurred to me yesterday during these meetings, I'm going to send Archbishop Chapu an email. He responds to emails at an unbelievably record time. He was installed in Philadelphia on Tuesday. I mean, the announcement was made on a Tuesday. Tuesday night I was sitting, I'd only met him once in the past, very briefly. I thought, well, let me send him a congratulatory message. So I sent him an email. Your Excellency, we are delighted that the Lord has chosen you to be our Archbishop. Totally delighted. And be assured of the prayers of myself, my wife, and our three daughters. That was sent at 9 o'clock. At 9.05. <laughs> Dear Adele, Rick... Lily, Elise, and Treese, thank you so much for welcoming me. Be uh, keep praying, exclamation points. So I'm going to take this idea of Father Harvey's that we had earlier to improve the treatment centers and take it to Archbishop Chapu in the future. When he was writing, one day he said to me, Rick, I'm going to be writing a book on homosexuality, a new book. And he said, I'm looking for a place to live while I write that book. Do you have any ideas? So I had a good friend who ran an addiction treatment center outside Philadelphia, Joe Driscoll. The Malvern Institute and said, Joe, Father Harvey's looking for a place to live while he writes his book on homosexuality, his second book. So Joe said, well, Rick, I have a, um, <laughs> I have a room way, <laughs> way up in the third floor where the roof slants down. It's a little room with a bed. And let's show it to him. So we took Father Harvey out there one day, showed it to him. He said, it's a deal. <laughs> so, so, so he spent many months... Um, in this living in this addiction treatment center, having breakfast and lunch and dinner with those in their recovery programs, and he wrote the book, The Truth About Homosexuality. He was very, I mean, I loved his meekness and his humility, he truly modeled after the Lord and St. Francis de Sales. And he said to me one day, Rick, what do you think I should title the second book? Do you have any ideas for the second book? And I was not a person given to correcting people that much at that point in my life, but I had to be honest with him. I said, well, Father, I have to be honest with you. The title of your first book was very unfortunate. There's no such thing as a homosexual person. The title would have been much better would have been Persons with Same-Sex Attractions. So he said, what, what do you think about the second book? And I said, well, truth. <laughs> There's truth in this area. Everyone thinks there isn't truth. There is truth in this area. We need to know the truth. And so he happened to choose that title. The, he, for me, um, when my eyes became more open, and I saw, uh-oh, we have this problem. Is be, this is not just a problem in my office with a few people. This is a problem in the church and the culture beyond anything I could ever imagine. 
And so when I feel partially burned out, I would call him regularly. Uh, he'd be my spiritual director therapist. Hang in there, Rick. Don't be discouraged. You know, God will triumph in this. Oftentimes when I'd be calling him, he would have, at this time of the year, it was the evening, the Philadelphia Phillies game, he'd have on the radio. So he was always multitasking. So when my wife criticizes me for multitasking, I said, dear Father John Harvey, remember. <laughs> in the, when the um, crisis in the church hit uh, and the post-crisis programs were developed, they were done with an attempt to deliberately cover up the role of homosexuality in the crisis in the church. So that in the Virtus programs, probably many of you took the Virtus programs, there were four myths taught about, homo- about the crisis in the church. And the third myth, okay, myth, was that homosexuality played a role in the crisis. Father Harvey, I can't believe it. (laughs) Calm down, Rick. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep persevering and trusting God. And I have to tell you that uh, with further events here, um, for example, the recent uh, John Jay Criminal College report, um, I miss him. I miss Father Harvey. But But the good thing is I... I know we can turn to him and pray to him, and I know his prayers are heard. Um, because in February, I had an opportunity to an example that I know he was interceding. God called him in December. In February, I had an opportunity to speak to 130 bishops on the role of homosexuality in the crisis in the church. I, I'm, in many parts of this country, I'm not viewed very favorably because, <laughs> because we, many priests come to us falsely accused. Hmm? They come, many, many priests come to us falsely accused. And oftentimes they're falsely accused, they're loyal, they're faithful, and they're falsely accused by those in the church who are not loyal and who are not faithful. And so, at any rate, so this opportunity to speak to 130 bishops about, I decided to speak to them, what I, my topic yesterday, um, same-sex attractions in youth and their right to inform consent, that is the right of youth to know the truth about the body of knowledge, the extensive, extensive body of knowledge on homosexuality. That body of knowledge, we in the Catholic Medical Association have put into a brochure, Homosexuality and Hope. You can obtain that um, pamphlet at our website, cathmed.org. That's C-A-T-H-M-E-D, cathmed.org. So with these bishops, I presented them the issues about causes, male confidence, serious male confidence problems, and those who had lacked eye-hand coordination, distant father relationships, poor body image, et cetera, and said we treat in our practice about five or six seminarians, different parts of the country with transitory same-sex attractions. These problems will be addressed and healed because there's a spiritual component to the program so they can move ahead to ordination. And I said, oh, by the way, those priests involved in the crisis in the church, all of them had severe problems. They were severely psychologically disordered. This was not, had nothing to do with availability, had to do with people, individuals who were severely disordered, highly narcissistic to act against their very nature as men. men. As men, we want to protect adolescent males. We want to form their character, to strengthen them as young men, not use them. So it's this total giving in to narcissism, et cetera. An archbishop from the Midwest, after I spoke, stood up, Archbishop Nauman. He said, oh, Dr. Fitzgibbons, you may not realize this, but what you've said deviates completely from the preliminary reports of the John Jay Criminal College Please explain the difference. So, Thank you, Father Harvey. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I know Father John helped me with that. I said, well, first of all, criminologists have absolutely no professional training in to understand complex sexual behavior between an adult and a child. So they should have recused themselves. Hmm? Secondly, those who asked for the study should have consulted with mental health professionals with acad- um, academically appointed who are not, who are above PC, a number of them, who would have said, Don't, you can't go there. Criminologists can't tell you causes of behavior like this. Secondly, if you're an employee of the State University of the System of New York and you make a comment critical of homosexuality, what happens to your tenure? I said to the bishops, you have in your possession a handout from the Catholic Medical Association homosexuality, and hope. I said, I co-authored that. And I also co-authored a textbook on anger for the American Psychological Association books, which is my real specialty. 
And my colleague at the University of Wisconsin, Bob Enright, said to me, Rick, if you had a faculty appointment in a department of psychiatry, co-authoring that pamphlet for the CMA would probably have cost you your tenure. Even though, what did we quote? We quoted, we quoted their, all the research, all the research that shows that if you love somebody, you want to tell them the truth about the homosexual lifestyle. You love them, yes, but you tell them the truth. For example, in, in May, in the journal Cancer, the study was published at Boston University that they did this big study of the health of men in California. And they discovered, wait a minute here, they've broken it down into sexual orientation. And so what, th what did they find in the study? So what, what was the median age of onset of cancer in men in the homosexual lifestyle? Any guesses? Age 41. Age 41. Okay. Twice as much cancer. Then looking at the psychiatric morbidity, the studies on psychiatric morbidity are just off the charts. So, so I made these points to the bishops, and so while well, two archbishops came out, came out and said, ah, the John Jay Criminal College has told us this is caused by availability. Um, since then, I have not seen any archbishops come out and make that comment, or bishops make that comment. Uh, and communicating, we have this month published a very lengthy article in our Catholic Medical Association journal, severely critiquing the John Jay Criminal College report. Um, if you want a copy of that, you can go to um, our website, maritalhealing.com. That's maritalhealing.com, where we also have posted the webinar that I gave to those bishops in Dallas. Um, <clears throat> So the, Father Harvey was tremendous in helping one feel su supported and strengthened. Even though he's not here with us, I feel, I believe very much that he's helping in terms of the battle now we face in marriage, the total attack upon all that is sacred in this culture, the unborn life, the elderly, and now the great sacrament of marriage. And so praying to him that the truth can come out there. We need his help in this one major area that and in the courts, there's a need for academic psychologists to testify hmm? about the truth in the literature. Most will not testify. Why won't they testify? They're afraid to testify. So there's one colleague I have who's, being, who's now working to go ahead and testify. He said to me yesterday on the phone, I can't believe it. He was in Washington, uh, the APA, filming for a new book that he's written, being published by the APA. I said, when I was down there, Rick, I heard that they voted in regard to same-sex marriage 159 to 0 in favor of it. And I said, Bob, if they knew the literature, if they really were psychologists who cared about people, they would never do that. You, you wouldn't want, I mean, understand that what goes on in the homosexual lifestyle, the lack of loyalty, the lack of fidelity, the pro profound narcissism, using, using, using people that there's no loyalty, there's no fidelity. Even these so-called marriages, they're, they're, they don't, there's, no, there's no longevity to them. And so what you have because of a lack of loyalty, lack of fidelity, you have significant depressive illness, you have high substance abuse, you have high levels of depression, anxiety, et cetera. So not to be positive, so, okay. uh, encourage. Um, courage has been a great gift to my professional life, my work, just being enriched, being here. Some of our patients are so strengthened by participating in courage. Um, the meetings, I think, are tremendous. I'm going to offer some suggestions later just to consider a thought about your meetings. Because in, it's very clear in the young mental health field, when you look at what's the trauma people have, it usually arises from one of four emotional sources and then one major personality disorder. Problem attaching to your father. Problem attaching to your mother problem attaching to siblings, and problems attaching to peers. And when you uncover those, those weaknesses, and many young people don't want to admit they have them, of course, but when you uncover them, then you can move in on the anger, help people forgive, move the capsule of anger that surrounds sadness, but then you have the loneliness, the loneliness for a father, the loneliness for a mother who wasn't controlling, and the loneliness for a male friend, Loneliness for girlfriends or a brother who loved you. And in the Catholic faith, we've given such a richness in our gifts that one could bring in St. Joseph as father into that womb, Our Lady as mother, and especially the Lord as friend and brother. Most of the males we work with in regard to homosexuality, their trauma is with their peers.
Their trauma is from being rejected in the male world by their male peers more than by their fathers. I mean, very few of my male friends had close father relationships. None of them have same-sex attractions. But why not? It's because most of them had great bonding with male peers through sports. They had great bonding through sports. They've never had same-sex attractions. So it's more than having a father who's distant. That can be a factor. But peer relationships, in many ways, are more important. I've had adolescents and college students in my office, and they've never, we review the history, and they reveal, reveal this horrendous treatment by their peers beginning in elementary school. And I've said to some of them, have you ever told your mother and your father about this? And the answer is no. I've never told them. Well, why haven't you told them? I'm too ashamed to tell them. It was too, tr- something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with my personhood, and I can't tell them what happened. Before I go on, one other thing I want to share with Father John, about Father John Harvey was this. Um, the transitioning of leadership of courage from Father John Harvey to Father Paul Cech was an enormous challenge. And Father John Harvey was treated in ways that were um, horrendous. And thank God, finally, for Archbishop Dolan, we had written him, he and I, the board had approved Father Harvey, but there were major obstructionists stopping the appointment of Father Paul Chuck. And we wrote him, Father Archbishop Dolan, one letter, Father Harvey and I, and we're on, we're on, we're on the membership board. It has to approve the board's decision for Father Chuck. And so Cardinal Archbishop Dolan wrote a letter, and then finally people fell into line, and the, tra- and the leadership could be transitioned. But during that time, I was saying to my wife, I couldn't take that. If that happened to me, what was done to him was done to me. I couldn't have tolerated that. And um, I began reading about St. Francis de Sales, and I recognized his meekness, his incredible meekness, enabled him to trust God through that, to rely on God, that God, would, God created courage, and that God would support courage. It's a new tremendous leadership we have now with Father Paul Scalia, and the great influence also of Father Paul Cech. I told Father Harvey another issue we talked about that uh, hopefully will come to the fore again. I mentioned earlier the post-crisis programs in the church. The post-crisis programs in the church should have addressed the issue. If you are a Roman Catholic priest, if you are an adult male, and you have attractions to an adolescent male, what should you do about it? This was the fundamental problem. This is what John Paul, that's what the first report stated. The second report, well, I'm not, We'll put that aside. And so even now, we need new safe environment programs that address the truth, that address why is an adult male homosexually attracted to an adolescent male? We've got to put that on the table. People need to hear about that. Bishops in their dioceses and religious and communities need conferences to understand what are the psychological dynamics. There are specific conflicts that make an adult male attracted to an adolescent male poor body image, loneliness during your adolescence, major unresolved anger from your adolescent period of life. And so I'm turning to Father John Harvey now and asking for his prayers. Move the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to deal with the truth. Let's don't cover up the truth anymore. Let's deal with the truth about homosexuality and address it and move to resolve it. <clears throat> One thing... Um, I want to say about courage, another thing about courage is really tremendous are these sports camps. Um, we talk about young men having the sports wound, the wound from not being accepted through sports. And I think the camps that courage has now have been phenomenal in helping men feel have a greater, much greater freedom in terms of their uh, being comfortable with themselves. Because I mean, the, the problem, one of the major problems in this culture is this total idolatry of sports. And we gave conferences to the priests in Kansas City, Kansas, last month. Father Chuck and Steve, great witness, and great witness yesterday, Jim, thank you. And um, at both those meetings, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, priests came up to me and said, what are we going to do about these traveling sports teams every weekend? You know? It's like sports idolatry. So if you have a family, and one of the boys is creatively gifted, artistically gifted, but not into sports, I mean, the trauma that he has from this is Unbelievable. 
So I think I just want to ask the priests here just to consider possibly preaching on the idolatry of sports. That because the view of masculinity the culture has differs totally from the view of masculinity that the church has and it's been in Western civilization. I mean, the culture says masculinity is determined when you're little by your athletic ability. Then it's determined by your body image. Okay? You've got to have muscles. Then it's determined by your sexual activity. You better be acting out or you're not really a man. Okay? But the church's view is radically different. Masculinity is based upon growing in virtue, virtus, strength. So the man, the true man is a man who becomes strong through virtue, not through sports, not through muscles, but through growing in virtues. And what's the goal of that? Well, the goal of that is to become another Christ, right? And then ips, ipse Christus, Christ himself. So, so radically different views. So we need fathers to convey this truth. The problem is that in the, with the contraceptive era, we've moved from the five-child Catholic family to the two-child Catholic family. Well, what does that mean? That means that fathers have given in to selfishness. The fathers lack the generosity they once had. I was speaking to the seminarians in a seminary in the West, and I said, I'm about self-giving. And the rector of the seminary said before I went in, I went through a whole list of conflicts in self-giving that we have on our website, maritalhealing.com, and the virtues that can overcome those conflicts. And the rector of the seminary said to me, Rick, I want you to focus in on selfishness. I want you to focus in on their being aware they have to fight against selfishness. I said, fair enough, Monsignor, because when I drive home at night, every night, it's one of the major things I pray. Lord, help me when I go home to my wife and my children not to be selfish. Help me fight against selfishness. Because as the Pope has said, it has a gravitational pull, force, rather, on all of us. It influences all of us in this, in this culture that we are, we are in today. So to these seminarians, I made the comment to them. I said, I don't, I'm sorry I have to tell you this, and I would rather not tell you this, but I have to tell you this. That any of you that came from families where your fathers only had two children, that you have modeled after a father who deviated from the tra traditional role of a Catholic father, if it was deliberate, okay? Your father lacked generosity in his self-giving, okay? And the danger is, in your future, if you want to move on to priesthood, that you unconsciously will repeat that. And you can't repeat that. You cannot repeat that. We've had enough narcissism in the sacrament of marriage. We've had enough narcissism in the sacrament of holy orders now for 40 years. It needs to be purified in both sacraments. It needs to be purified. And that's the reality. So we need, we need to look at ourselves. We need to fight against this weakness. And we need, because this is the, the major weakness in self-giving, is selfishness. Because selfishness takes us and it turns us in. And we're all hardwired in the image of God not to be turned in. We're hardwired to be giving, not to be turned in. Giving and, and then receiving. Well, okay, so I'm going to um, pause. And the, the, we have on our website, maritalhealing.com, um, and we just created a, um, a marital channel, youtube.com uh, backslash maritalhealing, a lot of video on identifying various weaknesses in self-giving, anger, selfishness, controlling tendencies, and we'd welcome you to look at them. And again, it's been a, uh, I feel myself completely renewed being here. Come here, wiped out, oh, these battles, marriages, everything else, you know, keep remembering it's God's battle, <laughs> not mine. And so, Father Harvey, thank you for all your blessings to us and help us all here. Thank you. Thoughts or I always believe and <clears throat> it took me a long time to accept this, but unless I get some criticism from speaking, I feel I'm not really doing God's will. So.
the John Jay report. And mm -hmm. I think it's because you're saying homosexuality is the symptom, but not the problem. But because it seemed to me that John Jay report said that it was homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And okay. Here's, here's, here's what. Here's what the here, here, here's the person was quoted. I forgot her name offhand, but her, her qualifications, her professional title, data analyst. So the data analyst, okay, as we, we're at the conference of bishops, Bishop Cordelione from uh, San Diego, um, Oakland, who's on the board of Courage, um, stood up and said, um, they weren't really questions. He was making statements. They said, the doc, they said, the Behaviors were homosexual, but the persons were not. Now, that person, who, who's, who made that statement? A data analyst made that statement. Please, a data analyst, you're quoting a data analyst about, so the behaviors, wait, the behavior was, the problem was homosexual behavior. You're right, homosexuality is a symptom, just like substance abuse is a symptom, or gambling, or you know, various addictions are symptoms of an underlying problem. That's what needs to be presented in safe, in safe environment programs. The causes of the compulsive behaviors need to be presented. Okay. My third comment um, <laughs> is that I, I'm hearing a lot about the father, the father relationship, which I do agree is important, but I think my sister would agree with me. We feel the mother is important because many yeah. children, particularly ourselves, viewed our father through our mother's eyes. And we frequently have said, we had a love affair with our father through our mother's eyes. Mm -hmm. Anything difficult about him, she explained to us, he's had a hard day, or this. Sorry. And we saw her love of him, and therefore we loved him. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, OK, there can be issues with fathers or with mothers, but also it's the way the parents interact with each other Absolutely. and support each other that can yeah. make a difference in a difficult father. Oh, totally. So, so, I mean, in the past, the psychoanal psychoanalytic view was, and we don't see this very often, domineering, controlling mother, okay? But if there is a controlling mother in the home, if, the, if we don't all fight against the tendency to control that we all have because of original sin, if we don't fight against that, then we don't treat our spouse with respect, okay? So... That's the major virtue that overcomes the controlling tendency. So a wife, if a wife doesn't treat her husband with respect, it definitely wounds the father-son relationship, and, and the son perceives the father as weak. Okay? Then, then we model after our fathers. right? So then we feel weak in our masculinity because we saw our fathers not being strong enough. to do. So it's very, very important that marital healing and strengthening marriage is extremely important. Um, Ephesians 5, that... We need to be respectful of our spouses. It's extremely important in our communication because if we're not, you're right, those can be the conditions in a home that can make a male vulnerable to, to feel weak in his mouth. Now, whether it would lead to homosexuality, I think that depends on other factors also. If he's a good athlete, it's not going to lead to homosexuality unless, unless the father is extremely, extremely weak. Most men we work with who had controlling mothers are the, most, are the angriest married men we treat. Okay? The only ones that are angrier are those who had abusive fathers. And they're furious because their father didn't stand up to their, they saw their fathers not being manly. Um, uh, their diocese, I mean, is a good diocese, but they, um, uh, they don't really have anything going on in terms, I don't think the priests should, uh, have very much awareness of these kind of issues at all in terms of same-sex attraction. So how, I'm a clinical psychologist in Omaha. Um, how would you recommend my somehow bringing this, like, I'd love to do something like that, like give a workshop that priests would require to go under penalty of death or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to give me your card later. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'd, I'd love to okay. hear about that. So I think, Father Chuck, I mean, I think inviting courage in. I think suggesting that courage be invited into the diocese, and that courage has, the courage has a wonderful program that we did in Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri last month. Um, first, the witness, Steve, or like Jim yesterday. Um, second, uh, the mental health professional, and third, Father Chuck. I think it's an extremely effective program. So I, I recommend that. Then I'd recommend acquiring um, the Catholic Medical Association's Homosexuality and Hope 
and have that sent to all the priests of the archdiocese if the bishop would be willing to do that. Um, I have spent a lot of time right now. I'm from Minnesota, and as many of you might know, it's going to be on the ballot in Minnesota um, come 2012. Uh, that man, that marriage will be defined as one man, one woman. Um, and I do a lot of talking to legislature, legislators and stuff like that. A little bit of time on YouTube, you know, contradicting some of the claims and stuff. Is there any bibliography out there that has some of the references to some of the material you talked about? Because I found it very difficult to find. I know it's out there. And the argument that I'm making is that um, you, the countries where you see this happening, the condition of the homosexual person or the person who struggles with this issue is not improving but getting worse. The suicide rates are going up. The STD rates are going up. In Minnesota alone, STD rates of uh, people in their 20s is going up by 13%, I think, annually. Uh, and this is in spite of what's being taught in the schools and in the sex curriculums. Is there a bibliography that I can consult and get some of these resources to tell the legislators and tell people? And I just want to you know, say this publicly to everybody in this room. No one else is saying this, so everybody here has to do this. You're right. You're telling everyone has to do this. We have to defend the sacrament of marriage. We have to defend the country. Look, I, I, would, I, I would recommend narth.com, then the Witherspoon Institute of Princeton, the website Public Discourse. A lot of scholars write in. Maggie Gallagher at the uh, Ave Maria University. These are some people I would contact in terms of, and then we've got you know, people, and then we've got a we have a problem, again, getting psychologists. We need academic psychologists or, or psychiatrists who are willing to put their head on the line, and they will be putting their head on the line. Um, we were discussing at uh, breakfast, and it seems like a lot of us who start with same-sex attraction uh, suffer from either male or female insufficiency because we have this uh, caricature of what it means to be a man or a woman in our heads, and we don't measure up, so we, we don't even try or we give up or whatever. Uh, and, and you mentioned in your talk that the prevalence in, in America of this idolatry of sports and this you know, strength and having to fight and all this stuff. How, how do we get past those caricatures and, and wow. get to the true masculinity, in, you know, to defeat that, that deeply ingrained image in our heads? This is interesting. A seminary in transitory same-sex attraction said to me recently, he said to me, he didn't play sports, his father was distant, his older brother was dif difficult with him. He said to me recently, I've been praying about this, going in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and asking God to show me what masculinity is. Show me, Lord, what is masculinity? How do you view masculinity? And he said to me, I've come to appreciate more and more that what makes me a man was not how my father treated me, not my ability to play sports, not my brother, not my male friendships. My masculinity is primarily determined by the degree to which I conform myself to Jesus Christ, Amen. the true man. Oh, what, a, what a thing, though, what a thing. I do think, this is one thing I've mentioned about courage meetings. Um, so meditation has been found to be very beneficial in cardiovascular diseases, a number of other diseases used up at Mass General. And I, I wonder about this in courage meetings, the possibility um, of a, a reflection, a brief meditation, if, there's a, if, if there wasn't an attachment to the father, St. Joseph as another father. If there wasn't an attachment to a mother or a controlling mother, Our Lady as the gentle mother. If there was an attachment to a brother or male friends, the Lord is one friends and, friend and brother. And going over grade school, middle school, high school, so many males we work with who were bullied, who were rejected because they weren't good in sports, they drive back to the elementary school they went to, or they do it in their mind. Okay? The, the, the gym, and they picture themselves there, and they picture the bullies here, they're here, and the Lord is here. And they picture, they grow in a sense of the Lord is the redeemer of mankind, you know, the Lord being there with them to strengthen them and, and to free them from the pain of rejection they had with their peers. And over time, what happens is, with these, <laughs> these males, is that they, they feel a greater fullness in their masculinity. They feel freer and freer in, in, their, in their masculinity. contrasting the church's view of masculinity um, against the, the culture's view. Could you do the same thing, please, for, for femininity? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's somewhat similar, I think, very similar. Because sports is becoming more and more a measure of femininity today. 
And so for femininity, I think it's not so much the athletic ability, but it, similar, it's like a pagan view of masculinity and femininity where the body becomes critically important. You know, And of course then with feminism, um, this has been a real problem with feminism in, in terms of mistrust of men. And, um, I'm more skilled in masculinity. <laughs> Maybe you could write an article about that. Um, Father. Lives. I was wondering if you might be able to say a few words relative to maybe that being intergenerational, maybe tying in with the idea of lack of male bonding. Uh, I heard uh, bits and pieces in the uh, realm of moral theology that maybe uh, this uh, contraceptive mentality would be intergenerational and it would uh, uh, cut down in communication, say, between fathers and sons and leading to such unfortunate manifestations as uh, classroom sex ed, supposedly to... Uh, oh, I think there's no question that the contraceptive era has profoundly wounded masculinity and femininity. That men, men aren't living according to their, and women according to their fundamental natures, their calling as males and females. There's that old adage that the use of hormonal contraceptives feminizes men and masculinizes women. And I think there's some truth in that because we see, we've seen a number of cases of marital infidelity. Uh, the men, unfaithful to their wives, they only had two children, and the men were unfulfilled in their masculinity. They were, they were meant for more than two children. They're meant to sacrifice themselves more. And because this faith that is men that really makes us strong, that's what that seminary was getting to, that's fundamentally our fit, that what makes us strong. All of us men want to be strong because we're called to be protectors, trustworthy. And the major issue, the, the virtue that makes us strong is our faith. But I think this issue of contraception has wrecked havoc in the sacrament of marriage and the sacrament of holy orders over the past 40 years. And that we really need a major purification in that area in order to free masculinity and truly free femininity. Uh, can you talk about, um, I was reading an article about estrogen in our water system and just, uh, lower sperm count in men yeah, over the last uh, 15 years and just uh, the effect of even men uh, being born with slightly more feminine features. That's scary. That's scary. I'm not that knowledgeable about it. I just read some several brief Bolton's about it, but I, I'm not that familiar with it, but it's, it's troubling. It's very, very troubling. Another toxic effect of the contraceptive mentality. How many patients um, I, how, many, how many patients do you have that may have gone through tra trauma because I've had brain cancer at five years old, and he had a very loving father. I used to do things like Joseph and very humble, and, and he helped him, you know, bake, and he was doing things around the house and the kids learned a lot of that stuff. But after that happened, he got rejection, couldn't do a lot of things from girls and, <coughs> and teachers because he was short and he was, had a little skid scar back. And, said, and he couldn't communicate in a nonverbal learning no disability. So now he's, he's very, he's been on for three years, but it seems like a friend, <coughs> not a relationship, but he tried a couple of times, but it doesn't communicate very well and he's very trusty. But he wants that friendship so bad that he's willing to just say, no, I'm going this way, these are my friends. And uh, we don't know how to approach it without pushing him away. And how many patients may you have that, how would you have dealt with that? Well, loneliness for fr male friendships is one of the major issues that we address. And so many, like teenagers, will come in and say, Doc, I know I was born this way, or college students. And often one of the first questions we ask them, well, not one of the first, but early on is, well, could you tell me the name of your male friends in elementary school? And many of them can't tell you anyone. I'm truly a male friend, you know? So this male friendship, so what we, an approach we take is, look, this, this wound, the, the lifestyle is a painful lifestyle. It's not a gay lifestyle. And uh, could you consider, like, I remember young people say to us, okay, doc, what can you do for me? Okay, what do you, what, what's your treatment approach? You know, well, you know, find the, take the history and then come up with a plan but there would be, you have an emptiness for male friendships. You have, you have a bad wound. God has, you've had the cross at a young age. We don't know why. You've had the cross at a very young age. And so friendship with Christ is something. This is one of the great gifts of courage, great blessings of courage, friendship with Christ. Friendship with Christ fills up, look, 
Every one of us who are married, every one of us brings into our marriages a certain loneliness. None of us have a perfect father. None of us have a perfect mother. We all have a certain loneliness we bring into our marriages. You know, the sacrament of holy orders in, in friendship with Christ, the grace of sacraments, fills that up, fills up that void so we don't get in trouble. How best get closer to God? Yeah, I, I think going to praying for him, going to the Lord as his best friend and hoping that, because what we find is if the friendship with the Lord deepens, and often does deepen through courage, then same-sex attractions go away. I want to end with one final anecdote. Tonight, I'm going, um, I have to leave right after this talk. Uh, my email address, uh, if any of you want to, uh, other thoughts, my email address is r, like Richard, r82488 at aol.com, r82488 at aol.com. But I'm going to have dinner with two friends. We usually go to see a Shakespeare play at the college where Father Harvey lived, the Sales University, and drive right by the um, community that he lived in. And my friend said to me he was a delayed vocation. He was ordained the Benedictine at age 57. And he said, when Father Harvey taught us moral theology at Catholic, one of the schools of theology in Washington, he said, we called him the Irish elf. <laughs> <laughs> they just delighted him. Well, thank you very much. Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. All right, well, tonight we have uh, two very special people to Father John Harvey, uh, and they have given of their heart to this apostolate for a long time, and I know from my experience with him and my conversations with him how dear both of them uh, were in his mind and heart. And so we will have the privilege of hearing some very special insights. And because ladies go first, we will hear from Tina. Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, really an honor to be here. Uh, when Father Cech invited me to give a testimony at this year's conference, he mentioned that we were especially going to pay tribute to Father Harvey this year. And of course, I, I couldn't turn down such an invitation. I was both honored and terrified to be asked to give a testimony, and I still am. Um, <laughs> uh, for years, I've managed to avoid giving a public courage testimony, but I guess my time has come. So uh, I've divided my talk into three parts. First, I'll tell you a little about myself. Then I'll tell you about my entry into courage. And then I'll conclude with my experience of Father Harvey, which I think is the most enjoyable part of the testimony, so I hope you stick around for the whole thing. <laughs> uh, <coughs> okay, so we'll start with me. As a little girl and an only child, I was very much a tomboy. I would wear skirts and dresses when my mother made me, but I definitely preferred to be in pants or shorts which were much more convenient for running and jumping and general unladylike behavior. <laughs> um, I wanted to pass for boy, and frankly, people, people often mistook me for one. I also noticed that in the, the comic books and stories that I read when I was little, the, the heroes were always the male character. The woman was always the one in need of rescuing, and she was the one fawning over the hero. And I wanted to be the hero. I wanted to be the strong one who could be trusted. I didn't want to be the one taking the risk of trusting. I remember when I was four or five, pondering the fact that I couldn't just choose to become a boy. I was a girl, and there was nothing I could do about it, and I remember having a keen sense of disappointment about this. I also remember being afraid of my father for most of my childhood and teenage years. I have no doubt that my dad loved me and always wanted what was best for me. He was generous and funny and full of life. <coughs> However, he also had a terrific temper, which, as some of you well know, I have inherited. Um, and I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to take this moment to apologize to those of you who have had the, um, the misfortune of experiencing my temper firsthand, and you know who you are. I'm very sorry. Um, anyway, um, I was always uh, deeply afraid of my dad's anger, and I think this fear later affected my ability to really trust any man with my heart. Women I felt I could trust... And my mom, the key female figure in my life, was not an angry person. I loved my mom very much, 
But at the same time, I remember thinking that I didn't want to be like her because when I was little, I perceived her as emotionally weak. Um, she would cry to me after my father had blown up at her, and I saw that she was afraid of him. And I reasoned to myself, as much as I love my mother, I, if I grow up to be like her, then one day I too might be married to a man I'll be afraid of. Um, in my early teens, I became more consciously aware of the fact that I was romantically and sexually attracted to members of my own gender. And this was alarming to me. I remember Jesus' words, you know, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. And I knew that adultery meant mortal sin, and that mortal sin meant eternal separation from God. I was convinced that I was heading for hell, and there was nothing I could do about it. And um, this was a rather alarming prospect, and it put me into a state of depression for most of my teen years. I was aware that it was the conflict between my religious beliefs and my still-forming sexuality that was putting me in the state of depression. I decided to talk to my parish priest about it. He was very kind and gentle, but he really didn't know how to help me. He convinced me it was just a stage and that I shouldn't uh, think too much about it. Having already fallen into the habits of masturbation and the occasional viewing or reading of pornography, I became afraid that I didn't have the willpower to spend the rest of my life living out the high demands of Catholic moral teaching. While still attending Sunday Mass and going to confession often, I, I started to read about other religions and philosophies. I was still a teenager at this time. Um, after much reading, speculating, philosophizing, and praying, and especially because of the witness and example of a close friend's family, as well as my grandmother, I realized that I sincerely believed that there was something special about Christianity. I really did believe the unique claims of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I also remember studying the claims of Catholicism and comparing them to various Protestant teachings. And again, I realized that I genuinely believed that the fullness of faith and truth was found in the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. My teenage spiritual journey, prompted by my struggles with same-sex attractions, had brought me full circle. Ironically, I was now more conflicted than ever because I was even stronger in my Catholic convictions and even more aware that active homosexuality was not something I could pursue in good conscience. I kept thinking, if only I become more religious, if I pray harder, maybe God will take these temptations away from me. And my family and friends did start to think of me as uh, something of a religious, a religious nut. And um, honestly, I can't say I blame them. They saw me becoming more overtly religious, while none of them knew what my deep, dark, secret struggle was. And meanwhile, I just kept hoping that God would take this cross away from me, that no one would ever have to know about it. Years later, in my mid-twenties, in spite of that kind priest's suggestion that I was just going through a stage, I still found myself primarily attracted to my own gender. It's not that I was never physically attracted to men. Occasionally, I was. However, I still found that my deeper emotional and romantic attractions were exclusively for women. I could like all the kind and good qualities in a man, and I could even love a man as an act of my will. But the spontaneous experience of developing a crush on someone or falling in love, you know, falling in love, that still only happened for me with women. All this time, I had never ever thought of taking any steps towards actually pursuing a homosexual relationship. Then, when I was in my last year of university, I learned that two male friends of mine were involved with each other. I also learned that a female friend of mine had come out of the closet and was looking to be in a relationship. It wouldn't be an overstatement to tell you that these revelations kind of rocked my world. I was suddenly very tempted to pursue a same-sex relationship. Remarkably, thus far I had given very little thought to the fact that there were other human beings on this planet going through the same particular struggles and temptations as myself. I was dimly aware that there was a gay, a gay community out there, but I'd never been even remotely interested in looking into it because, frankly, I associated it with promiscuity and disease. It was also around this time that I read my parish bulletin about a local courage meeting. I'd heard about courage some years before, but I didn't know we had a group in our city. When I saw that there was a local group, I knew that this was a meeting I needed to attend because of my own personal struggles, and I trusted it would be good for me. After much anxiety and prayer, and more anxiety, I finally made up my mind to call the number. First, I spoke privately with Don, who was then the main contact for the Toronto group. 
Once Don had ascertained that I was on board with the goals of courage, he told me where and when the group met. He also mentioned that at that time, there weren't any other women attending the group, but he wanted me to feel welcome to attend all the same. I will always, always be grateful for this hospitality extended to me by the Toronto Courage Group. Even though their membership at the time was all male, they still invited me to attend the meetings because they simply wanted to be supportive of another human being who shared their struggles and their goals. Now, I still remember what was going through my mind as I nervously imagined attending my first Courage meeting. For some reason, I envisioned a dimly lit church with shadowy figures sparsely scattered throughout the pews. <laughs> it's true. I, I saw, uh, you know, men with dark glasses and trench coats and fedoras. <laughs> and kind of a, a James Bond film noir setting. As, as it turned out, we met in a cozy, well-lit room in the church basement, and nobody was dressed like a character from a 1930s spy movie. <laughs> the guys were very friendly and welcoming, and I was grateful for their kindness and support. I remember being especially grateful for Bob, or I should say uh, Chase Bob. Um, I really appreciated his presence at my first meetings. Um, Bob, as many of you know, there he is, uh, is very funny. He has a wonderful way of making people laugh, and that was a real blessing um, during this very vulnerable time in my life. I should mention that at that time, three of my biggest fears or anxieties were uh, speaking in group settings, speaking to men, <laughs> and speaking about really personal stuff. <laughs> so, you know, here I was in a group full of men talking about the most personal things in my life, and amazingly, it was all right. It was safe, I was accepted, and I belonged. Attending those early meetings took a great burden off my shoulders because as many of us know from personal experience, there's a huge relief which comes with finally speaking honestly and openly about the nature of our struggles and temptations. This to me is the great gift of courage. We have a place to go where others not only understand our particular weaknesses, they also share the faith that is near and dear to our hearts. It so happened that during my first year of being a Courage member, I had the privilege of accompanying my grandmother on a pilgrimage of the Marian shrines of Europe. And one of the places we visited was Lourdes. And you know, one of the things you can do when you visit the Grotto of St. Bernadette is you can get dunked in the miraculous stream of water and you're supposed to make a quick private prayer intention just before you go under. Well, my private intention just before getting dunked was that I would one day have the opportunity to work for courage, which, which is why I now very solemnly tell people, be careful what you pray for when you go to Lourdes. <laughs> That's what I'm okay. On this same pilgrimage, we also had the wonderful blessing of unexpectedly meeting Mother Teresa while walking outside of St. Peter's Square in Rome. Mother Teresa gave my grandmother and I miraculous medals, which I have safely kept till this day. Anyway, after a year of meetings with the Toronto Courage Group, I went off to Steubenville to pursue an MA in theology. During that year on campus at Franciscan University, we did manage to get a Courage meeting going, and once again, I was blessed with a good support system, and I, as I recall, one of the members is also present here tonight, but I won't mention any names since this is being recorded. Okay. Towards the end of that year in Steubenville, I wrote to Father Harvey in New York and told him how much I admired him and his ministry. I also mentioned that if there was any capacity in which I could work for courage, I'd be happy to do it. Well, it just so happened that his assistant at the time was about to retire. And it also happened that Father Harvey received my letter on the feast day of St. Francis de Sales. Well, happily, Father took this as a sign that he should hire me. So, you know, we'd, we'd never met each other in person, and I was a Canadian citizen who'd have to jump through a few hoops to get the right working papers. But dear Father Harvey was all ready to offer me a job on the strength of the letter I'd written and because of the significant date on which he'd received it. And I was over the moon happy about this. I still remember listening to the phone message Father left at my place in Steubenville. And to be honest, I wasn't quite sure what he was saying on the message, and I, <laughs> I, I, I had to listen to it a few times, being in American accents, you know. But when it was, <laughs> but, but when, I, when I finally figured out that he was offering me a job, I was thrilled. 
And I, I hadn't finished my MA at Franciscan, but I knew I could continue to pursue it from other locations through their distance ed program. So I made plans to go back home briefly to Toronto after my school year and then relocate to New York City. Now, another miracle that occurred at this time is that my parents, my Indian parents, didn't object to their only child, a female, going off to New York City, where she'd never been before, to live on her own and work for a church ministry. Now, in case you missed it, the key words in that sentence were Indian parents, female, <laughs> only child, New York City, live on her own in church ministry. <laughs> so, um, that, that, my friends, was a huge miracle that I was able to launch off on what appeared to be an impractical and potentially dangerous venture into a state of certain poverty with no, with no op- opposition from my parents and only support. I, I really felt God had a hand in that. I also remember as I was getting ready to leave Steubenville that I had a few loose ends to tie up. And I thought to myself, Lord, I just need about $500 to cover a few outstanding expenses. Then at least I can arrive in New York on a better footing. So I started saying in Novena to St. Joseph that I would receive some financial help. And apparently right about this time, Maria, who was my predecessor, said to Father Harvey, you know, Father, Tina will probably need some money for moving expenses. And apparently Father responded and said, you're right, how much should we send? And Maria, God bless her, said, I think you should send her $500. (laughs) Well, apparently, dear Father, immediately wrote a check for $500 and mailed it off to me without telling me a word. So you can imagine my expression when I received a check in the mail from Father Harvey for the exact amount I'd been praying for. You know, I thought the Holy Spirit is definitely at work. So... Well, okay, now I get to tell you about um, the most adventurous part of all, which was my actual Courage experience in New York City. What was wonderful for me about being part of Courage in New York was the strong sense of community. There, I was blessed for the first time with the company and support of other female Courage members. We had our own women's meetings led by Father Harvey himself, but we also had the company of the Courage men at Days of Recollection and at various social events like I have permission to mention names here, like, like Brad's Fourth of July parties or summer afternoons at Yvonne's place in Long Beach. Um, I still remember when a group of us took dance lessons together. I believe we learned to Lindy Hop, Waltz, and Merengue, and that was fun. And then there were Sally's historic and personal tours of Little Italy, uh, cooking lessons with young Frank, and uh, group outings to Saturday matinee movies. And I just want to mention, if you want an exciting afternoon, you should really go see a movie with Regina. Um, she gets she gets very caught up in the movie, and you're guaranteed to leave with a smile on your face. You know, we we got shushed while watching Finding Nemo. <laughs> it was, you know, and Regina was on the edge of her seat, and, and just she, she couldn't stand the suspense. So, <laughs> so. there were also dinners at local diners, Irish pubs, and various restaurants. We went to coffee houses, concerts, and sometimes even black tie events. In case you were wondering, the guys wore the black ties. <laughs> uh, Courage in New York City was truly a community experience. And perhaps best of all, I had Father Harvey for a boss. And I have to tell you that having Father Harvey for a boss has uh, pretty much spoiled me for life because now I tend to have unrealistic expectations of my subsequent bosses. Um, A typical day at the Courage office meant you got a hug from Father in the morning and a blessing from Father at the end of the day. My favorite time of the week was Friday evenings. Um, After a long and stressful week at the office, and uh, believe me, it was stressful, and Angelo and Pat, I know, will back me up in this, um, we would stop answering the phones on Friday at 5.30 p.m., and we'd pour ourselves a drink. Now, don't don't be scandalized. It was just one drink, not six or seven. Um, And um, Father would have scotch, and I'd have some wine. And uh, we just put our feet up and talk about anything under the sun. And usually I'd run out to get us a bite to eat from a place downstairs called Bagel Mavens, or Began Megan's, as Father would call it. (laughs) I I don't know why, but Father would always make up his own version of certain names and then stick to the made-up version. Um, at least, at least once a month, we'd go out for dinner or lunch together, and he always encouraged me to feel free to talk about whatever was on my mind. I've since come to see, much to my regret, that this sort of comfortable, easygoing exchange doesn't always occur in other workplaces. Um, <laughs> most people don't get to go to movies or ball games with their boss. 
And the ball games were great. On a few occasions, Father accompanied Yvonne, Regina, Maureen, and myself to ball games. And whether it was the Brooklyn Cyclones or the New York Mets or on rare occasions even the Yankees, um, Father would get happily caught up in the game and explaining each play of the game to us from start to finish. Um, we loved being his girls, you know. Um, I also remember when the movie The Exorcist was re-released in, in the year 2000. Um, both Father and I were interested in seeing it. And I have to tell you, it's very cool to enter a movie theater filled with people waiting to see The Exorcist when you're accompanied by a priest. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, especially an, an, older ple- an older priest who's clear- clearly wearing his collar, a black blazer, and his signature black fedora. <laughs> It, it reminded me of that famous scene in The Exorcist where Father Marin first arrives at Regan's house and you have that iconic image of a priestly silhouette pausing under the streetlight. I mean, it was like arriving with Max von Sydow himself and I think a couple of people at the theater may have actually thought it was him. Um, the, su- the sweetest part was when Father, you know, all gentlemanly-like and fatherly as usual, said, Now, dear, if you start to get frightened, you can hold my hand. <laughs> And I, I, I believe I did hold his hand a couple of times. Um, of, of the many, many good things Father Harvey did for all of us, um, I think the most significant and meaningful thing he did for me personally was come and visit my dad when he lay dying of lung cancer in a hospital bed. Father Harvey was one of the few priests my dad really liked and respected. I was hoping the dad would have the opportunity to see a priest, but I was reluctant to, to raise the topic, knowing how rebellious dad sometimes was towards religion in general. Well, one day, when I was on the phone with my already hospitalized father, quickly planning my return home to Toronto, Father Harvey happened to be in the room with me, and he asked to speak to Dad on the phone. I heard Father say to Dad, You know, I'd really like to come and visit you and help you prepare your soul for eternity. He said it directly and gently. According to my mom, my dad told her afterwards that he felt a wonderful, uplifting presence when Father Harvey proposed visiting, and Dad didn't hesitate to say, Yes, please come. A few days after I got home to Toronto, Father Harvey was also there in the hospital hearing my dad's confession and giving him Holy Communion. And nine days later, my dad entered eternity, and Father Harvey flew up to Toronto again to say a private funeral mass for the repose of my father's soul and for the consolation of my family. I was so grateful to Father Harvey for this. And I also want to mention here, to give my own dad full credit, that he did learn to be warm and affectionate later in life. And I also learned to be affectionate with him. In my late teens and early 20s, Dad and I learned to hug each other more often and to tell each other, I love you. My parents' relationship with each other also grew as my, as my dad learned to treat my mom with more respect and consideration. A good measure of healing had already begun in our family, and our family continues to grow and heal to this day, even while Dad is in eternity and we're still here on this earth. As I said, I have been spoilt. Um, As a Catholic person dealing with same-sex attractions, I've had a dream team of support. Father Harvey is my boss, confessor, and spiritual director, a plethora of brave and faithful priests and courage, Peter Rudiger as a friend and therapist, and the Courage Support System with all my amazing brothers and sisters in Christ to turn to for encouragement and friendship. I will share with you honestly that over my years as a Courage member, In spite of all that wonderful support, I have still had my struggles and my falls. During those times, I struggled most with the fact that I was working for a ministry that that promoted chastity, but sometimes was failing miserably in living out that chastity in my own life. At those times, it felt like the devil was dancing on my head and taunting me constantly. But during those times, Father Harvey was always a gentle father, offering me guidance and spiritual direction. I'm reminded of that scripture verse, the bruised reed he does not break, and that was how Father treated me when he knew I was struggling. And to be honest, to this day, I still find myself vulnerable to same-sex attractions. However, I'm no longer obsessed with asking God to take this cross away from me as I was when I was a teenager. Most of the time, I'm able to view my weakness as a permitted thorn in the flesh that keeps me humble and hopefully becomes a source of grace. Other times, I happily don't think about it at all. And when I do, I remind myself that much of my life is a mystery even to myself. I I don't have all the answers here and now, and I don't have to have them. 
I try to maintain an openness to God's grace and healing in whatever form that takes. It's likely I will remain single all my life, as thus far I haven't discerned God calling me to either married life or religious life. But that's just me. God's call in each life is different. Only he knows the state of life that's best for each of us. When Father Harvey suddenly passed away last December, four years after my dad's death, I was grateful that I could come down and attend Father's funeral mass, that I could be there to pray and mark that significant event the same way he'd been there for my family when Dad died. Every one of us has his own way of mourning or remembering those who have passed on, and I'm sure each of us are remembering Father and honoring him in our own private ways. Me? I like to imagine Father, Father Harvey's entry into eternity like this. He suddenly finds himself walking into a giant baseball stadium, packed with souls cheering wildly, and then God's voice comes over the loudspeaker saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. And then I see Father being embraced by Jesus, and then being re- reunited with his own dear mother and his other relatives and friends. Finally, Father puts on his baseball glove and baseball hat, climbs the pitcher's mound, and starts to play ball with some of his favorite sports heroes. Now, I've always believed, even while Father was alive, that one day he would be canonized. Um, For years, we plotted to ask Timmy to give Father a haircut just so we could save some of his hairs. We never got around to that. Um, I know there are a lot of human beings who live holy and saintly lives who remain uncanonized, but I believe the work Father Harvey started through courage is something very, very special, and that God will bless this ministry further by giving special recognition to the very dear soul who helped to start it. And if we haven't done so already, um, perhaps in the next few months we can all take some time to write down how this dear priest has positively impacted our lives so we can be ready when the church starts collecting such information. And I pray that time will soon come. Um, I'll close now with some words of wisdom from Father Harvey. Sometimes Father would see that I was obsessively worrying about something petty or something from the past I couldn't do anything about. And he would say to me, You know what I say, dear, when I'm worrying about something I can't do anything about? What, Father? I say, the hell with it. (laughs) You know, that's good advice. That's that's great advice. And perhaps we should all say to those neurotic worries that obstruct our full experience of joy and to those dark memories that keep us in a state of shame and regret, the hell with it. (laughs) Because now, in addition to Jesus and Mary and the angels and saints and the souls in purgatory, we also have Father Harvey interceding on our behalf. And I believe right now he's urging each of us to keep pressing forward with God's grace until we also fully enter the joy of the kingdom. And that should really be a source of courage for all of us. Amen? because you know like how anxious I was about doing this so I really 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 appreciate it because every time I start to get nervous I think okay, they're praying for me so you know <laughs> so okay. yes uh, where are you working now where are you working now? oh I, I'm working at the, the University of Toronto as a program assistant and a web administrator and um, I, my, my main focus right now is helping my mom look after my grandma so I, my job right now is it's just a job it's like something not too stressful so I can Focus on family. So, yes. What kind of scotch did Father Harvey like? <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer to 
Ah, okay. Uh, uh, Shivas Regal. He liked Shivas Regal. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, thought. That's, that's, that's true. Yeah. I wanted to say to you, Tina, you know, personally, and I think I've said this to you privately, but it's appropriate that, that the meeting should know this, that you know, I was there since 1999, and Tina brought me in. And Father, you were, every, each one of us was, of course, very special to Father Harvey in our, in our own uniqueness, and I don't want to, um, anyone to, th to, to take this as meaning that they were any less special to Father, but Tina, you were the emotional daughter of his heart. You know, I, 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 it's like, I always think like, like all the neat ways that God works in, in our lives. And I just, I really feel like with fathers, he was so gentle, we all know like how gentle and kind he was. And I, I, it was so healing to have like a male figure in my life like that, you know, uh, just, um, and the fact that, I, I mean, anything under the sun, really, you could talk to him about. It was really great. And I, I think we, especially as in the women's group, we felt very, very blessed to have that kind of a male presence um, in our lives. Will you write a book about the <laughs> <laughs> well, you? Know, you might get a check sent to you. <laughs> 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 no, uh, maybe, uh, maybe. I, I was meaning to do more writing, so maybe I'll, I'll do that one day. Yeah. Hi, James. I just, I just want to say it was a, a privilege and a pleasure being in those meetings with you. Thank you. 17 years ago. The, uh, yes. The, yes. Likewise, um, we, we were we were very fortunate to get a group started in, in Steubenville as well, um, and met some great people there. And some of you know. Still going. And you're still going. Oh, good. Yes, Tracy. Uh, have you prayed to Father Harvey since his death, and, and have you had any special experience of his presence? Well, yes. I'm. I'm. I'm like all kinds of things. <laughs> that I, you know, I was like, Father, please help me with this, with that, with that, and. Um, um, one of the things I think um, Alan is here somewhere. Uh, he would. Uh, one of the things that that happened significantly um, six months after his death, um, exactly six months, was uh, we've been having some issues in Toronto with the, people are trying to start these gay straight alliances in the high schools, and you know we're are, we're opposed, trying to oppose it on the grounds of like, basically because the terminology is problematic and. Um, it's it's so great because six months to the to the date of father's death, uh, this fantastic pastoral letter came out through the Canadian bishops, you know, just, and um, uh, it was just really really well worded. And we just felt like that was the result of um, you know father's uh, intercession for us. Another thing, I, I guess, under more personal note, is at home, uh, my grandmother said that the other day she she's, she's uh, struggling with dementia now, and she said, you know, uh, who is that that priest that you, that came and visited us? Uh, a little while ago, and I said, you mean Father Harvey? She said, yes, I, I, I see him sometimes. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's great, <laughs> you know. So I just, I keep, I'm thinking maybe he's, you know, bringing her consolation or comfort in some way in her uh, condition right now. So. Anything else? Oh, hi, Tim. Thank you for your testimony. It was very good. I wanted to ask you, are there courage uh, meetings in Toronto, and do you attend them? Oh, <laughs> yes, there are, there are definitely courage meetings in Toronto, and uh, it's, it's a pretty stable group, and they meet regularly. And I confess, right now, I have not been attending them regularly. I drop in from time to time. Uh, one of the things that I kind of experienced post working for courage is I kind of, I think any place when you, especially in ministry, when you work there a very, very long time, you you kind of feel a little burnt out, right? And and plus, sometimes I think because I spent so much of my life, like like I was dwelling on this topic of same-sex attractions, like round the clock, because it was my work, but it was also my social life, because you know these are these are my friends and people I hung out with. Um, it's like sometimes a part of me just I have I'm being honest with you. Sometimes I just want to take a break from the topic, like I just want to sit back and do other things and pursue other interests. I'm. I'm Grateful to know that there is a group there in Toronto, and when I, if I should need, you know, suddenly something comes up and I need support, I know there are meetings I can go to. Um, so, there's my honest answer to that. Yeah. Anything else? Tina, thank you. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Of our next speaker, someone that we all know well and whose commitment to this apostolate for so long has uh, made it possible uh, for many people to understand in a very personal way, a very pastoral way, something that is complex and controversial. And Angelo's touch on the phone, by email, in person, is something that's been a great blessing for us. And like Tina, uh, Angelo also was another good soul, attracted by Father Harvey's good soul, and now we're going to hear from him. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Our Lady, Queen of Peace. Well, like Tina, when I was asked to do the testimony, I um, immediately tensed up and probably wanted to evaporate. <laughs> and um, but in all honesty, you know, I, I, I asked myself, I, I guess, why me? And um, it really didn't. Um, I guess I didn't want to talk about myself. I didn't want to dig into the past or sound foolish and get into the whole human respect thing. But it didn't take long before realizing it really wasn't about me per se. And um, I realized that I'm a walking miracle. And by God's grace, you know, the Lord wants me to share this good news because when I think back, being in the lifestyle was bondage, and I didn't know anything other. I would have never thought that I would be standing here, and um, the lifestyle could eat you up and chew you out, as you all, as many of you know. I also wanted to do it for Father Harvey, who loved courage and encouraged very much. So I yielded to the Holy Spirit, and it was like flipping through a photo album portions of my life was flashing before me. So um, this is where I begin. I immediately see a lost boy, a small boy. Um, one of my sisters had once told me that my mother used to tell her to, you know, go over to Angelo, he looks so sad. And I'm the youngest of six, six children and um, three girls. I had three big sisters and then three boys. I, um, another image came to me right away. I, you know, I saw myself just going from room to room at night. I just felt so alone and so lost. I just wanted to sleep with someone. So it was like from brother to brother to sister. I mean, it was really good if I can get in the bed with my mother and father. Um, I was just so scared. I think back, it was almost as if I didn't exist. I don't know if any of you, it was almost as if I, I just felt like I, I, I wasn't there. Um, or like I didn't want to be in anybody's way. Um, but this wandering just continued for many years into my adulthood, including from going from bed to bed, of course. Um, we're an Italian Catholic family, uh, and I grew up in a crowded housing project on Staten Island, New York. And like many with this struggle at a very young age, I, I, of course, I just didn't fit in. And I've, you know, many of you know it, I've heard it said by many, given their testimony, and I, I just wasn't like the other boys, or, or, although, I mean, that's what I perceived. It was during these times I also thought my father didn't like me. Um, he worked two jobs and was not around a lot. But what was disturbing was the fact that he was kind and funny to neighbors and friends, and I used to see that, and I just didn't get it. Um, a, a very painful memory for me was, I remember being young, and we used to go to the beach a lot. My father was a lifeguard at one point many years ago, and um, I was at Rockaway Beach, and my father was holding me in the water, and I mean, it meant everything for me because there was really, I mean, it was everything. And I remember a wave came, and I slid off of him. And I could still feel the slipping off his skin. 
And I just said, he, he let me go. You know, I just, I just didn't get it. And yet, another memory that came to mind was years later, though, I guess this was somewhat redemptive, I was probably like around 12 years, and fear gripped me after seeing, and I have to mention, Exorcist 1. It's weird you mentioned Exorcist 2. But I saw Exorcist 1, and I, 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 that film scared the living crap out of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. And it lasted for, I remember a few months, like day in and day out, I used to think of this. It was awful. And I was getting these like obsessive, intrusive thoughts of this movie, and it was terrible. I, I was holding this in. I wasn't saying anything to anybody. And yet, I, I believe... A sibling. Someone told me that eventually it was written on my face. I, I guess they saw something was wrong with me. And um, I sat with my father, and he spoke to me and just told me things like, well, you know, God's more powerful than, every, than anything, and, you know, this is just a movie. And it went away like that. I mean, I just needed to hear my father, you know, just give me, comfort me and give me security that I guess I never felt from him, so. But like that. You know, perception has so much power and played into my ambivalence towards men. Um, I just thinking of how many times I've spoken to parents and, and, and I've heard their struggles, and, and I've heard them say that they've done everything that they can, you know, with their children and to be there. And, and I just remember saying, you know, so very often the child itself has so much needs, you know, that you can only do so much. You know, the rest is really divine intervention. Um, in my situation, I've asked my siblings about certain occurrences at home. But it didn't seem to phase them. Or, or, you know, I think what it comes down to, they, they weren't getting angry at these situations that I was getting angry at, uh, especially with my father. Um, I mean, one of my older sisters, Vera, who many of you know, she identifies with that same-sex attraction. And eventually, you know, I mean, she had a conversion and came back to the church and eventually worked for Father Harvey years, you know, down the line. Um, But there was some, we, we, would, we would speak. We would speak about like what went on. And, and it's great. There's one wonderful thing about speaking to siblings. I mean, you have similar fears and you have similar, you know, you can really work things out with each other. And that's been a blessing for me, especially as, I, as I've gotten older. Um, so naturally, it was easy to identify with girls, and I carefully surrounded myself with them. Um, I remember the lure towards um, playing with dolls, and um, I didn't have any. I, I, I didn't have any, but would borrow and you know the girls that I played with. And you know, I, I could only play with the Ken doll, and although Ken wasn't even enough, I wanted the GI Joe, and I, I couldn't get. I just GI Joe was tough, you know. Um, but it, it was. Let me tell you. In the projects playing with dolls, I remember it was uh, there was strategy involved because I had to we had to play at a certain place, and if I saw anybody coming, you know, I kind of like would turn turn around and uh, you know because you know in this situation, any bit of weakness, anything you were ranked on, forget it, you know, and that's I, I had to protect myself there. I mean, I, it was teasing, but it didn't crush me, and I, I, it wasn't really brutal. I was a survivor, and, and, and I knew something had to be done, though, and I discovered basketball. And it was like my way back into the pack. It, it was wonderful, and I loved it. I loved it. It was a, a great escape, and I was pretty good. Um, I was fast, and, and what was really nice is some of the older boys, the teens, used to call me muskrat <laughs> because I was fast. And it was really nice because I was being noticed. I, I was getting attention and affirmation was coming my way. That was a big deal. It, was, it, it really meant a lot. Um, I was the type of kid that got along with everyone and thus made, you know, that's how I made my way through the high school years. Uh, this was 
a time though when marijuana entered my life and the feelings of SSA were beginning to take hold of me. You know, it's, it, it's sad because in hindsight, I mean, it's nothing profound, but even the, the pot smoking was a way to connect, was a way to be, to be accepted, uh, but it came at a cost. Um, interesting, it's really sad because I remember, you know, and this is real brokenness, but, you know, and not wanting to hurt anybody else's feelings, you know, I, I compromised my own. You know, when I look back, and it, it was just really, really sad, just to be accepted. Um, my emotional life consumed me and gave way to compulsive behavior, you know, drugs, masturbation, smoking, and it just a fantasy life, just somewhere where I could just escape and, and medicate. It just all seemed too hard. Eventually, the next step was to participate in the sex act and to devour another man, what I'm lacking. And even when I was writing this, I think of Mobley's theory. I mean, I can understand that very, very much so, how you just want to devour the person that you're with, that you're having sex with, because you just feel, I felt inadequate. Um, something in me became unleashed, and thus the drug and thus the gay life. Um, in no time, a partner, gay bars, the double life, the shame, the hiding. Um, I'll, I'll spare the sort of details. Um, in 1983, I was just short of 23 years old, I took off to San Diego. And in a way, that was good for me to leave home and to learn to care for myself, you know, to, to, to mature that way, because I, I had sort of like a... Um, a symbiotic relationship with my mother even and I knew that I had to kind of break that and, and she knew also and, and she gave me her blessing um, I had dropped out of college I, I didn't have any direction I didn't have direction at all as I said my emotions were holding me hostage was holding my intellect hostage so I just couldn't enter into college it was too I just couldn't do it um, I, I, I vividly remember saying goodbye to my parents at the airport and knew and knew that God will always take care of me. I didn't know the person of Jesus, but I knew God would take care of me. It was the seeds that were planted a long time ago. You know, I mean, my, I, I think of the faith of my mother. Um, I also had an aunt who was a cloistered nun, and I'm sure her prayers helped all of us. A couple of years in San Diego, and eventually I, I headed up to Los Angeles, up to West Hollywood, and there, every, every person and everything was gay. Um, it was more drugs, Donna Summer. <laughs> the gym, which was like a temple, and, and just a lot of gay drama, as many of you know. Um, I had a partner from South Africa who eventually, I was very sad, he died of AIDS. But... Um, Even though I had a partner, there was a lot of sexual activity outside of our relationship. I remember I even got caught up in, I was dealing drugs, dealing marijuana. I remember going out to Indiana several times. It's funny because when I meet people from Indiana, I, I get like trance-like, you know, because it kind of like, the, oh God, I remember that, you know, being... <laughs> No offense, I met great people here from Indiana. <laughs> I'm just saying, every time I hear Indiana, you know. Um, but these addictions, I mean, they, they consumed me. And the very fact that I, um, you know, the very fact that, again, it was, I felt accepted, like in that lifestyle. It might have been, it was not authentic, but I, you're accepted and you belong and it felt good and, and like nothing else mattered. I mean, I, I remember in the day, and I hate to say this, but, you know, it, it was, you know, it was wonderful in that sense. Um, but it was tough. It, it was also 1980s, and, and, and AIDS was, was happening. And um, I remember I was, uh, had a very good friend who had AIDS, and, and I was over there, and I was helping him out, and, and I remember... At one point, he was calling my name, and I didn't know what was going on. And 
the aide said he was going blind as I was and he was crawling on the floor and I just knew something this isn't good this isn't good I remember always 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 looking and searching like that little boy it just went on I was just always searching wandering wandering the streets something I didn't know what it was but I can just see myself walking in the streets and just always just so empty and always looking for someone to save me because I just didn't have it. Um, it's interesting when I was writing this and all of a sudden it came up, I remember my mother wanted to visit me during this time and I was living in a, a one bedroom with Andrew and, and I had to tell her on the phone prior to her arrival I only had a one bedroom apartment so it would have been a given you know I had to say something and um, I told her about myself and her response very calmly but with authority she just said you know what the church teaches well my mother just did a slam dunk on me because I didn't know you know it just it, it, it was it was wow um, it was said in love and I loved her all the more for it. Maybe not at that moment, but there was something about that. I, 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 there was a lot of gratitude. And, and it really helped the trip. It helped to be with her. No, I, I needed to hear that. Um, she, was a real, she was a real neat lady. Uh, in 1993, my life took a major turn with the sudden death of my mother. She just had a massive heart attack, and I received a call on the morning of May 3rd, and I was in New York by the evening. And at the funeral home, uh, there was a priest, a Father Francis Marino, who would eventually play, play more of a part in my life, was saying some inspirational words, and at one point he just looked at me and said, you know, God sometimes takes a life to save a life. And I knew what he meant. But it was at my mother's funeral mass that I first met Father Harvey with Gary, a courage member here tonight. And I'll be honest, I remember when I saw Father Harvey, I said, oh God, it's him. <laughs> My sister used to always spoke so fondly of Father Harvey, but you know, to me, he was in charge of them. <laughs> and, um, but it was beautiful. You know, my sister, when she worked with Father Harvey, she used to send me the newsletters. And, you know, it's interesting how the divine intervention, because I, I never, I don't remember throwing them away. I used to put them in a cupboard. I could still see where I used to put them. I don't even think I looked at them, but I just kept them there. Um, needless to say, that was a very, very chaotic year. I, I, I left my job at Disney. I was working for Disney. Um, um, studios and um, it was just more destructive behavior and um, I, I would say start of, a, of an emotional breakdown it was very very frightening again some very crazy scary intrusive images um, and thoughts day in and day out uh, it was agonizing um, from the minute I woke up and it lasted for several months and I thought I, this is it I'm, 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 I'm losing it um, very scary. Almost, I, I, when I think back, it could have gotten a little like psychotic. It was just really, really, really intense. Um, I, I finally reached out to my brother, who by now he was or, he was ordained a priest, a late vocation, and um, again, like I said, you know, he knew these fears himself, and he had worked through them. So he was really good to speak to at the time, because for him this wasn't so crazy what I was going through. So that really helped me out. And he was an older sibling, and, and I needed that from him. Um, 
he did, he suggested, I remember the rosary. And I, I just remember saying, like, I, I think many of you might have experienced this, like, how do I say it? I, I kind of remember, I forget, you know. And, 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 but even in that, though, I'll tell you, I remember like it was yesterday, I remember saying, what the hell happened to me? What happened? You know, I, that was so disturbing. I, I entered into it and I started saying it, uh, praying the rosary, and, and I could tell you it was from my heart. It was real, real good medicine. Um, eventually, after that, um, I had a tremendous experience. Um, uh, I, I, it ended up being Mercy Sunday, but what, what did I know about Mercy Sunday? Um, but I remember the, 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 the priest mentioning the Holy Spirit, and, and something hit me. I just remembered, oh, that's the, you know, that's the bird. That's the dove. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just said, you know, I just thought back when I was a kid, you know. And it was great because it was just soothing to see that image and to come, um, you know, to come upon me. Um, and then soon after that, it was, it was a major change in my life. Um, in July of 1995, my brother, Father Charles, Charlie Charles, uh, called and dropped a bomb on me because he said to me, how would you like to go to a courage conference in the Bronx? And I was, it just floored me. He said he'd pay for everything and personally get me there himself. It just floored me. And, but I knew in my heart I had to go, just had to go. Um, initially, there was no room at the inn, as they say, but um, Maria, at the time, um, had told my brother that somebody had canceled at the last minute. They even left a deposit for me, yeah. I said, oh, God's faithfulness, um, good example of his faithfulness. Uh, the first day of the conference, at the entrance of the Passionist Retreat House in Riverdale, I, panic sort of like your trench coat experience, I'm sure it was the same thing. I, 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 um, but I, I, I met a, um, a vivacious, very friendly, affable pastoral priest who set me at ease. And Father Timon just gave me this big, big welcome. And I knew something said, this guy's going to be instrumental in my life. And, and he is, he's a good friend to this day. And I knew he was a keeper. Um, but from the moment the conference began, I couldn't stop crying. It's a little embarrassing. <laughs> I would hear a talk, go to my room and cry. Share at meals, go to my room, cry. Um, David Morrison gave his testimony that year, and during one of my crying sessions on, on the grass hill overlooking the Hudson, he came up to me, and it was really beautiful the way we shared. It was really a, a tender moment, and I needed that from another brother in Christ. Um, after the conference, it was just so dramatic that uh, I went back to, uh, to West Hollywood and I was attending, um, I belonged to St. Victor's Parish, and I just remember asking the pastor, what, what about this, the, when I was at this retreat, they had this like adoration, you know, and he said, well, what do you mean, what about it? We have it here every week. <laughs> kind of hit me, you know, I, what, what, what did I know? But, but he did say to me, if you want it, I just wanted it more and more. He told me about these, this Dominican, these Dominican sisters at the foothill of the Hollywood Hills. And I'll tell you, that's probably why that place hasn't blown up yet, because these nuns are there praying. Beautiful community. Um, eventually, through that prayer, I, I had contacted, I, I knew I had to get out of there. I, you know, how do you do this conference and then go back to West Hollywood? Um, I had contacted uh, the Anawan community, which is a lay Catholic community my sister had belonged to and my brother. And I, and I knew them over the years, and this is that France, Father Francis Marino who spoke at the funeral. He was the, the founder of the community. And, um, and the co-founder is, is a Sister Barbara who was in the Blessed Sacrament Sisters with my aunt. So, you know, it all kind of connects. Um, so basically, uh, you talk about a grace. I mean, I sold, I sold most of my belongings, shipped the rest, and got out of Dodge. I was out within 90 days. I left after the conference. I was out of West Hollywood in 90 days, 
and I ended up uh, back east in, in, uh, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. It, that was a little tough. It was like going from West Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard to the banks of the Delaware River. It, it was a little, <laughs> that was hard, but you know, it was a death to self, but we do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, they actually put me in a house for like nine months. There were no, there were no men, single men down there at the time, so um, it was just the, the nine months, needless to say, a lot of tears. It was that snowstorm of 96. I didn't know what hit me. I was in California all those years. Um, I was in vans and doing 360s. It was, it was tough. It was a real... But you know what? It was all part of my healing process when I, when I think back. And, you know, I had to trust someone, and why not these people? I knew that God had led me to them. Um, and the Anawan community was wonderful. They catechized me and re-catechized me. It was wonderful. You know, it was, we dialogued daily. We, we, the, the liturgy of the hours, it was a nightly exam, and it was community. I, I really didn't know what community was, but it was community. It was wonderful. And in time, I was asked to go to the Philippines. I was there for a couple of years for formation and interestingly enough to help moderate the courage meetings there because the Anawan community had brought courage to the Philippines and they, till this day they still oversee Father Dan who, who has been at this conference a couple of years ago they still oversee the courage um, apostolate um, it was a real blessing um, I had been attending courage meetings in the Lehigh Valley and also um, Father Timon, once again, was running meetings at St. Agnes in New York City, so it was really good, the, the fellowship there and what I was learning. Um, I, I, you know, when I think back, I was finding purpose in my life. I, I really never had any purpose. And, you know, living in community had its challenges, but it helped me to grow. And, and I realized that transformation and freedom was happening, uh, although my addictive side wanted out, um, life had gotten somewhat, you know, it had gotten sterile for me, but, I, you know, I was so, you know, where's my next kick? Where's my next, you know, in the lifestyle? and the, it, It's always that next, you want that kick. And, and I was really living in community. It really helped me that, you know, life isn't about that. I was growing up. You know... If I may, there is an intense warlike aspect of this struggle. And for men with SSA, it's so constant. The visuals, the images, wanting the fix. Um, I, I heard many members say at meetings, and including myself, I know this, that they thought that they would die if they didn't see that image, that pornographic image. Eventually, I, I physically, I left the animal community after four years. I never left the spirituality, which continues to anchor me in my faith, and that's, I know, what kept me and got me here at Courage. Um, and in time, Father Harvey in the Courage office, and to, you know, enters the picture. Um, at, at first, actually in 2000, uh, Tina and Father Harvey took me in as a part-timer, while seeking full-time employment um, in the New York City area. I had gone back into the New York City area. And then again in 2005, of course, Father Timon contacted me regarding a full-time position. There's a story here, but I'll save it for another time, like later on this evening, a good pint. <laughs> but there's a story. But anyway, uh, um, it was baptism by fire, believe me. Um, I can attest to the supernatural powers that be, having worked this end of the vineyard. Um, at the time, um, at I was attending courage meetings in the Metuchen Diocese. It, it was just a, a, a joy to work, you know, with, with Tina and Pat, Frank and Sister Dolores, Julie. Great volunteers, you know, Richard, Ken, and Jim are just top shelf volunteers. Christine, and now with Father Chuck and Jerry and Michelle, it's just been a real, real, real gift. Um, courage for me it equates to community. Staying connected with each other is not just important, but it's vital. It's a powerful and grace-filled moment to call one of my brothers, or they call me at the onset or in the midst of a lust attack. Someone to listen, 
You know, we're all wounded healers. And, and this is such a good tool, and I, and I share this with, with you here. I mean, this is the good fight in growth. You know, when you feel it coming on, just pick up the phone. You know, we, we meet each other here, and, and we need each other. Um, and I'll tell you, very often the person that's calling, <laughs> they're looking for help, but it's the other guy that gets the more help. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the two coming together. Because then you hang up and you, almost, you feel needed. You know, you feel like, you know, so empowered. And that's chastity. I've been very, very fortunate to have established close relationships with my Courage and Encourage family, and so special to even, I mean, God bless me, and I know there's people when we, you know, work in the office and they say they live in these places that there's no one here, and, and I always know that God will look after them and, 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 and put them with who they need to be put with, but I just happen to have brothers right on Staten Island, Jim and Bill, they're just wonderful, and they're right there, and again, community. Um, I learned that my honesty and humility is tested at meetings and it benefits the group to expose my weaknesses because it weakens the hold. It's these weaknesses that bring us together. Um, you, you know, I learned things, I'm just going to get very practical here. I mean, it, it's just things like I remember, you know, being at, you know, I'm at a gas station and if I see a, a, a man at the other pump and, and, and I get a charge, you know, I, I don't have to enter into it. I don't have to let it consume me. I can learn to just say, you know what? We're equals. He's not better than me, and I'm not better than him. But that's chastity, and that helps me. And that help, but, it, but it's constant. It has to constantly be practiced. Very men will say that happens to them, and what you do right away, acknowledge the feeling. Don't repress it. I mean, that's what you know, got me here in the first place is the, rep the repression but acknowledge it, you know, the old, good old, solid, offer it up and say a prayer for the man. I'm telling you, you get the grace and you walk away empowered. Um, it's just about getting rid of all the old tapes. Um, and, and I'll be honest, till this day, sometimes when I'm in a room with other men, I, I have to remember that. I'm not less than them, nobody's better than me, we're all the same, I, you know, I could feel awkward or out of place, but, you know, just, just enter into it. You're not that little boy anymore. Just enter into it. Just listen. Don't give into it, you know. It, 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 it just... And you realize it's a blessing with those thoughts and when you act upon that, when I act upon that. Um, another, another just quick story I just want to say because these are the things that helped me. I remember being in my courage group I'll just say, John, he's married a, a father of six, and a married man, father of six, he's sharing at a meeting one day, you know, how he was driving and, you know, made contact with another driver, and, you know, you get the charge, the charge came, but really, you know what he said? He said, like, you know, it's the old, somebody noticed me. You know, it's just feeling non-existent or just feeling that, that need to be affirmed. Also, another story that hit me hard. I remember a courage member came to me who's now married with kids. Came to me in the New York office and after some idle chit-chat looked at me and said, you know, Angelo, it doesn't go away. And I said, yeah, but, you know, your desires are in a different place. You know, you've done a lot of work on yourself. You go to, you know, courage meetings. He's, he, he's gone to gym. He knows about 12 steps. So, you know, you work it now. You just work it. It doesn't, it doesn't completely go away. I mean, different periods in, in my life, when I'm feeling more vulnerable or out of control, it's going to kick in. The driving forces, the, the, what's driving the SSA feelings, and that's what I try to work on. The insecurity. I remember there's so much to be said, you know, uh, I get calls at the office or even at home, and, you know, and I just remember, you know, saying, so you had a fall. You had a fall. That's, you know, you acted out with another person or engaged in autoerotic episodes. It's a new day. It's a new moment. Don't let it just, you know, you, you don't have to fall apart for the next three weeks. Just 
just get up, brush yourself off with a contract height, and go on. You know, I, I just go on my way, and I just praise God. And I really think that's why the good Lord fell as many times as he did. He's the model. You know, Father Harvey, I, I, I remember would say that, you know, from the constant sharing of experiences, each member draws strength to practice virtue, and no longer does he feel alone. And I, you know, a big part of my healing came, and, you know, it, it, it comes from forgiving. And I can remember the moment, and it was a moment of grace when it hit me so hard. I remember saying, do I really think that my father didn't love me? I mean, such compassion and understanding came, came upon me. It's just like something just lifted. It was all that perception. Um, you know, as a courage member, I'm always trying to work the five goals, which are, which are foundational to this apostolate. And you might say they're my marching orders. As an addict, there is a need to be continually restored to the human race and avoid isolation. I am so blessed, life-giving, it's a, to have these healthy, chaste relationships, these friendships. I just want to share now my memory to Father Harvey. Now I wanted to get just... I immediately see the Irish smile when I started writing this. Although he made it clear to me that he was raised by an Italian uncle in South Philly. <laughs> It was uncanny how Father, at his age, would reenact a Phillies game, play by play, with all the vigor of the Sandlot Southpaw that he was. He beamed. <laughs> Once Father hit 90 and began to come to terms as a man with his physical weaknesses, we would walk together arm in arm at the end of the workday to the rectory at St. Vincent de Paul and talk about all sorts of things. I'm just giving you some memories. It's not really connected. It's just how, how it came to me. It was just, I cherish those moments. And Father was so pastoral, as you all know, very desalian and gentle, especially when it came to counseling. I, 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 I remember a story. I remember him being on the phone with a 16-year-old from Long Island, and you know, Father had listened to him for a little while, and, and he, you could obviously tell it was, he wanted to talk, and, and I heard Father say, no, excuse me, like, didn't I let you talk? Now, now can you just let me say something? <laughs> you know, he just had a certain way. Um, but don't, you know, don't any of you think that that came easily for him? Um, Again, Father was a South Philly scrapper. He had, he had an Irish temper, and I identified with that, and pastorally, Father knew that I had a temper. It was sort of like a punch first and talk later. <laughs> uh, but he had to learn how to fund that. You know, he really, he, he really did. Uh, uh, you know, anybody in the office can remember, you know, Father, <laughs> I could just hear him say, oh, hell. He says, oh, hell. Don't these people know we have a lot of work to do? Damn it. <laughs> but you know what was beautiful? Five minutes later, I would hear, I would, almost, I would hear and say, uh, he would say, uh, 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 and I'd look up and he'd say, I'm going to be all right now. I'm going right to go back to work. Um, uh, but I, I watched Father exercise self-mastery and obedience, you know, by always praying the breviary. Um, he's just an old religious, and he was very disciplined. Uh, Father was a, he was a real stickler for time. I can almost see him right now letting me know that a, I have three minutes. Uh, <laughs> write, write down, um, scheduling the conference, on a call in the office. He would often hang up, hang up the phone, look at the clock, and say, oh, 22 minutes. It was, really, it was really something else, but he had everything right, you know, right down. Or, or, or he'd write a letter to a bishop and say, you know, like, uh, nine minutes, I, I took care of that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it really wasn't about, you know, it was really about how do I fit everything in that God wants me to do. It really, it wasn't like the way I would say it. You know, he, 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 
he was just great. He, he, these conferences, the Days of Recollection, um, his travel to, as he would say, help out priests and bishops. Um, <laughs> all, oh yeah, he was all part of the, the duties of his state of life. Um, absolutely obedient to any person who was his superior. He always consulted prudently on any decision. Um, all my years working with Father Harvey, there are a few sayings that will always resonate in my mind and heart. I used to love when he would say, you don't need permission to practice virtue. When people would wanted to start a courage group somewhere in the States and they were having a hard time. Um, something else, he said, when one desires wholeness and holiness, any, wholeness and holiness, anything could happen. It's not about changing so much so. It's desiring wholeness and holiness. He would then oftentimes say, avoid fantasy, stay in reality. And then there were a few times in the years that I worked with him, he'd say, Angelo, if we don't do this for Jesus, we're fools. And then he would add a little tag and say, and I know the faces, and he would do like, hey, Lord. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, yeah, that was his seal. Yeah, I, I think it was wonderful. Father was a great traveling companion. I, I traveled with him down to EWTN. I was on uh, Life on the Rock with him, and we also traveled to New Orleans. Very easy to travel with. Um, I, I, Tina, like yourself, at the end of the workday, although by the time I worked with Father, it was 5 o'clock and not 5.30. That was <laughs> yeah, yeah, before he boarded the bus. Uh, it, the great moments, great moments. Pat, uh, it was usually Pat, Sister Dolores, and myself and Father. And he would say, you know, those little eyes, he would even say, oh, it's time for a drop of the creature. <laughs> um, just a thimble full just a thimble full and a little cracker but I used to like sometimes I would say Father is it alright you know if I, I said you know it was a tough work week you know if, can, I, can I have another one oh sure sure, <laughs> sure. Um, and not that this happened a lot because I don't want you to think that you know that we <laughs> drank a lot. <laughs> but when there was an empty bottle, it was great. And Pat reminded me of this. He used to say, "Oh, uh, it would used to go in the garbage can, a dead soldier presided over by a priest." <laughs> <laughs> so I just. <laughs> Um, but Father, I just have to, you know, uh, um, Father had a, uh, again, sort of what Tina mentioned, and, and, and uh, Father had a heightened respect for women, and especially love for the courage women. It was really, really, really very, very um, powerful, a good example, as far as that goes. Um, I remember the, the, the 90th birthday celebration was extraordinary for him. And I remember the look on his face and such gratitude and happiness for all of us that were there. And, and you know, think about, it was what Cardinal Berg said the other night, you know, that not being understood and even from his own community, so now he gets this, you know, from us. Um, when he went to Child's, you know, over the last year, when he went to Child's, Maryland, you know, it was really so good. I, I spoke to him, like, nearly, nearly every day. He, he, he would call. I think he tagged him between Tina and myself. He was just calling back and forth and attempting... He was attempting to keep office hours for himself, working for courage. <laughs> uh, he was just, you know, with the, with the boots on. Um, as he got weaker and weaker, he kept pushing himself to do everything he could do for courage and in support for Father Check. I'm blessed, and we're all blessed, to have had such a shining example of gentle valor in our lives. He was a good father. Thanks.
I just want to tell you that um, I can remember many meetings with Vera uh, when you were struggling, and she would say, always spoke about you, we got to pray for my brother. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I remember so you at my first conference, answer. so thank you. Yeah. Angelo, uh, I'm here today because of Father Harvey. He came to Melbourne in 2003, and Alan and I attended that with our son and daughter, that meeting of uh, Dr. Peter Rudiger came and uh, we uh, were asked to put our names down on a list to show an expression of interest and, you know, you know the rest. But, you know, I've, co I've contacted uh, New York Courage many, many times. I always get Angelo. And your, um, your loving um, line at the end, you know, may the peace of Christ be with you or may, um, you know, some other really beautiful saying, I would always write them down and then when I emailed someone else, I popped that on the end and they would... <laughs> They probably think I was really holy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. And I was going to laugh on, on, on how you always did like his impressions. You know, like you oh, always uh -huh. had like, and, and and we just do it by August last because you had him down to a to a team. Well, we spent a lot of time together. <laughs> Exodus, I thought, wow, we really don't get a lot of support, and that that must be ten times worse for courage. And um, how did and I've heard stories about Father Harvey had tough times. How did you work in that environment where you knew? It sounds great inside, but how did you deal with knowing that it's <coughs> Father Harvey deal with? There's mm -hmm. not a lot of support outside. Well, he just stayed at it. It was just like he knew it was, you know, it was his call within a call, I guess you might say, and he knew it was his to do. He just knew that he always made himself available. He was just always there, always wanted to help. And it wasn't like he was, it wasn't about knocking down doors. It was, it would come to the office. And he just, you know, was there to support and, and, and do what he can to just make it, to make it happen. Didn't always happen. As you know, I mean, it didn't. It doesn't always happen, but he was always there. It was his to do. Yeah, not giving up. Yeah. Paul, your testimony blew me away, but I have to ask. Oh God. <laughs> How did I meet the South African guy? It was, you're in the city, man. You know, you just meet, you know. It's, yeah, you know, it, 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 we just, it was um, through another South African. It was. <laughs> Very tough, very tough. At first, I wanted to, but I, I, I just couldn't. It, it, it was hard. Um, you know, when you're in the lifestyle, I mean, that whole the, the whole promiscuity lingo is just you know it's so much part of the life. I tried to keep in contact with people and, and wonder. You know, we all know great people from the lifestyle. You know, and needless, but it was very, very hard. I just had to. It, it had to stop, and it wasn't. Um, I just remember I had to ask one time a very good friend of mine, you know, if he could just respect where I'm at. I just didn't want to hear about that, you know, about his sex life and what was going on. So eventually it, it just stopped. I do hear from one friend every now and again, but it just had to, and I'd pray for them. It just, it was, it just couldn't do it when somebody's still there. Sure. Who's Pat? very artistically gifted in, uh, in a number of areas, but also very, very, very visual. Do you practice anything like, you know, the Eastern discipline of cuts to the eyes, or how do you deal with the onslaught of the visual in our current culture? You no, know, very, very much so. Um, I mean, from going to courage meetings and from hearing other, uh, my brothers in Christ share, um, 
I, I, I do. I, I try not to allow myself to, to go into, say, a, 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 a lust attack. Um, um, I yield to the Holy Spirit constantly. It doesn't mean that it takes it away. I mean, I'm just constantly yielding to the Holy Spirit. Um, and the more that I do that, I know it kind of sounds like big pie in the sky stuff, but that's what one does. I, I, I acknowledge what's going on. I acknowledge the, 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 the temptation. And then I just yield to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it works. I'll, I'll even talk about it, too, to, to get it out. You have to keep that, that you know, constant communication connecting. about the first conference. I remember talking to you at that first conference that you came to, how confused you were. Mm -hmm. And you were going back to West Hollywood and everything. And I've seen you grow through these years and how much you become a man that I'm Thank proud you. to call my friend Thank and you. my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have seen this evening uh, such magnificent examples of the virtues of humility and courage. I'll see you down there. God bless you. All right, let's begin with our prayer, Radiating Christ, please, if you would stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Jesus, help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being, so utterly that our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence in our soul. Let them look up and see no longer us, but only Jesus. Stay with us, and then we shall begin to shine as you shine, so to shine as to be a light to others. The light, O Jesus, will be all from you. None of it will be ours. It will be you shining on others through us. Let us thus praise you in the way you love best, by shining on those around us. Let us preach you without preaching, not by words, but by our example, by the catching force, the sympathetic influence of what we do, the evident fullness of the love our hearts bear to you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, our talk today. And I want to let you know that the board of directors and I are very solidly behind Bishop Paprocki's request to further the cause of Mary Stakovich. Uh, she, in our judgment, has given that heroic witness uh, and serves both the courage and encourage apostolates because of her fidelity to the truth. And Pope John Paul, in his encyclical letter, Veritatis Splendor, of uh, 1993 indicated that we cannot live, we cannot expect to live the moral life in a fallen world without encountering suffering and turbulence and much sacrifice all the way to the point of martyrdom. And here is a woman, in other words, very ordinary circumstances, a mother, uh, a part-time worker in the funeral home, a part-time worker and uh, support in her parish, who gives testimony to the truth. And so we will continue to promote her cause and to make the prayer cards available to you uh, uh, because I believe that the bishop is, is correct and he is going to submit now his judgment to, to the church, as we must always do, and we will see uh, if the church gives us uh, her approbation. The title of my talk uh, this afternoon, and I'll try to compress it a little bit, being mindful of the time, and I'm happy to give way, of course, to 
uh, uh, the sacred liturgy. Uh, the title of the talk is The Triumph of Failure, and it is dedicated in a special way to Father Harvey, and it is not in any way to suggest or imply that there was any failure in his life, but I think you'll see in the course of the talk uh, what it is that I'm uh, trying to convey uh, in this way. The fundamental desire of our hearts and souls after we have been baptized is to please God. It is the single most important aspiration to please him and to do his will in all things. And to the extent that with his grace we are able to do that, then our earthly life has been a success. Holiness of life, sanctity, the perfection of the soul is our most concern, important concern as Christians. But we also know that as St. Paul says with such humility in his letter to the Romans, the good things I want to do, I don't always do. The evil that I want to avoid, that is what I do. And that struggle exists within all of us. But it is not a foregone conclusion. It is not a necessary fact of our human condition that we will live mediocre lives. Jesus Christ calls us to sanctity. He calls us to holiness. And therefore, it must be possible, with God's grace, to attain what he asks. We are to face the trials of this life just as our Lord faced the trials of his own. And because we believe that he is good, we know that he would never ask us to do what is impossible or what is unreasonable. That would be repugnant to his wisdom and his goodness. Now, we do experience from time to time a sadness. We have the sense that no progress or very little progress has been made. The virtues are not being achieved. The ladder of charity has been largely unclimbed. We have been alive, but we have not really lived. We have invested purpose and meaning we know in the wrong places. How tragic it, tragic it is that so many, in the words of one spiritual writer, stumble into the grave. There may have been a lot of activity. There may have been a lot of utility. But perhaps there has not been consistent self-giving. This life, which God has been so generous to give to us, is the vestibule to heaven. We can think of ourselves as being in the novitiate for eternity. And so our activities here should be a reflection of the life to come. What we do in time, in this life, should bear direct relation to what we hope to be doing in eternity. Failures will, from time to time, come. But God's grace can remedy all human weakness. Even grave crimes, even grave sins, have not prevented many souls who, after a conversion of heart, have achieved great heights of sanctity. We fail, not necessarily because our passions are strong or our wills are weak, but we fail because we allow the meaning and purpose of our lives to be obscured. We concern ourselves with the wrong goals or objectives. And that is why, my dear brothers and sisters, we must study the life of Christ and never take our eyes off him. St. Paul said we must put on the mind of Christ to know and embrace his way of life, his philosophy of life. We may still fall, even repeatedly, but we will always then re re return to a secure foundation or direction that will give us meaning and give us purpose. We know that Jesus carried his cross daily with heroic fortitude, with heroic courage. What was it that moved him? What was in his mind? What was in his soul? 
In the letter to the Hebrews, we find these familiar words, for we do not have a high priest who cannot have compassion on our infirmities, but one who is tempted in all things like we are without sin. How we feel gives us some indication of what was going on in Jesus' human mind and heart and soul. The conscience, which is such a great gift from God, directs us. And even when we choose wrongly, that conscience is pointing us to the good. And that conscience helps us to understand something of the mind and heart of Jesus Christ. We tend to order the importance of things in such a way that at some future point, we will conduct ourselves in a more perfect way, more spiritually, such that we will accept less perfect intentions now. Again, we are thinking in the future, I'm going to be better. Somehow I will have more virtue. I will cooperate with grace later. I will be doing things that cooperate with God's will in a better way in five years. But Jesus did not do this. He gave himself perfectly at each moment and with the deliberate desire, always the deliberate desire to want to please his Father. He knew that the passion would be the most important moment of his life, but this did not weaken his commitment to what was immediately before him. He gave the attention of his soul to the present moment as though it was the only thing he had to do. Thus giving that present moment, what was immediately before him, kind of an absolute value. The doing of this thing, that what was before him in a given moment, was given to him by the Father, and so he gave his all. He invested his heart in it entirely in complete cooperation with the Holy Spirit. In the farewell farewell discourse as recorded by St. John, John 14, verse 35, he says, As the Father has commanded me, even so I do. John 12, verse 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Do you see how our Lord's attention is all on what is before him, all what is at hand, and not going beyond that? In other words, it was not the effects or the consequences of his actions what he hoped to achieve, what he hoped to bring about that moved him or inspired him. Good and noble though those objectives were. What moved him was that filial desire, that filial spirit of love to do what his father asked and only to please his father. He begins the gospel in this way, the finding in the temple. He says to Our Lady, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And then he concludes the gospel with consummatum est. It is fulfilled, it is completed. We can try to imagine, as our Lord hangs on the cross, how he's carefully reviewing in his mind, even in a moment of great suffering, whether he had carried out the will of his father to the last detail. And so, St. John records, afterwards, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the sacred scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Those words illuminate what was going on in his soul and the care that he took in ensuring that he was being faithful to what the father asked of him. And so here's what we learn. Purifying intention, the perfection of intention, fidelity to the Father's will as opposed to what we are hoping to bring about and to achieve. Perfection is not 
first found in setting events in motion externally, what's going to happen outside of me because I choose this or I do something else, but rather perfection is set in motion by reacting inside. Am I doing what God has asked me to do? And that is precisely how our Lord refashioned creation. It is how he refashioned human life. This is how he revolutionized the world by making himself so completely obedient, faithful, and docile. He molded or shaped events by giving himself, not by imposing himself. And in this sense, his life was more of a passion than an external action. Yes, there was so much physical and mental exertion. How well did he endure us? Those who said so little understanding and sympathy, even those who were closest to him. But he knew, he knew that his purpose was being fulfilled despite the resistance, despite the misunderstanding, and so he never lost his peace. Of course, he thought about accomplishing the good things that he set himself to. He taught to persuade people. He loved in the hope of being loved in return. But he did not find in these things the motive for what he was doing or the inspiration for his work, even if the hoped-for results would not be achieved at all. He would give himself not one bit less. So in Jesus' minds, it took nothing from the value of what he was doing if things he hoped to achieve, teaching and having his teaching understood and responded to, loving and hoping that that response would come of love. In Jesus' mind, it took nothing from the value of what he was doing if the things that he hoped to bring about didn't happen. Because the highest good for him was what the Father asked him to do apart from its effects. And that was enough for him. And so he gave himself without reserve to what was before him. What was all important was doing well what the Father asked. This is faithful service to God. And so all aspects of Jesus' life are perfect, whether he is speaking or whether he is quiet, whether he is moving or whether he is resting. And there is the path to perfection because it is the transformation of the heart and not of circumstance that is the heart of the gospel. Now we have to say, so that we don't misunderstand, that Jesus' life was intensely active. He was not in any way passive or a pacifist. But his greatness comes not from the conquest of things, but from self-giving. And despite his abundant gifts, his life, such as men judge things, appeared to be a complete failure. Those whom he healed were ungrateful. Those who he taught remained ignorant. Hearts he labored to soften remained hard. Neither his eloquence nor his kindness won the loyalty of his people. Those he did win with few exceptions, abandon him at the end of his life. When we read the gospel, we may have the sense that Jesus was moved by the knowledge, his own knowledge, of his ultimate success. We might think that what kept him going forward was he knew how the story would end, in effect. But if that's the way we allow our minds to go, we will undermine the very perfection of his self-giving and of his courage. And so we cannot think that way. He was not motivated by what we see as the ultimate success of the Paschal mystery. He foresaw the salvation of the world, that is true. But that did not ease at all the sharpness or sadness of his life. His courage was perfect because he gave himself entirely. Not because success was achieved externally, but because he did what his father asked him. 
And though he knew that he would fail to persuade us, and he spoke the truth in the best way adapted to the human mind, nothing will ever supersede the parables as teaching tools. And he knew how this truth would explain the meaning of life and give peace and joy. He knew it would help us to understand who we are and who God is and who we are in relation to him. He knew that he would fail to persuade us. But he never lost his peace. Opposition did not lead to resentment. Failure to transform hearts does not cause him to despair or to renounce his efforts. He was never petulant. Each day, no matter the previous day's failure, his courage remains undaunted and his energy undimmed. It was as though the disappointments of yesterday were not to be expected today. Surely Jesus felt pain, the pain of rejection and betrayal, but he did not have indignation in a sinful sense. He didn't have resentment in a sinful sense. He did not feel shame in a sinful sense. He did not have irritation in a sinful way. He did not have bitterness or hardness of heart. He was never disheartened, even though his heart was much burdened. He faced ingratitude and forgetfulness on the part of those he healed and comforted with tenderness and mercy. He worked miracles, reasoned powerfully, and though without apparent success, he continued without any loss of courage. He knew his triumphs were temporary and superficial. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles what he did, but as St. John tells us, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. To be misunderstood by his enemies or the multitude would have been tolerable had he only been understood by his friends. Of all his sufferings, the loneliness of his soul, even his isolation must have been among the most bitter. His heart ached to be understood. He was wounded by the insensitivity of those around him. He felt a sharp pain and sob within the heart. He said, do you not understand? but he never gave in to hopelessness. Apart from the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, perhaps St. John the Beloved and St. Mary Magdalene, it would seem no one really did understand him. The desertion of his followers was the great crowning of his life. Jesus did not enjoy this, the, the gift that many saints have. Of, seeing, of being the witness of the fruit of his own labors. We can think of many saints who at their death could see the flowering of grace through their work, but Jesus did not even have that blessing. He never gave up. He never thought his life was useless, unsuccessful in an immediate sense in producing good effects, but perfect in the sense of doing God's will each day he went about doing good, maintaining his calm, content with doing things in the right way and for the right reason. Repeated pain and disappointment did not cause him to renounce his work or to become inactive. He always did the right thing because that was the right thing to do. He was never deterred by the fear of humiliation or failure. He may have appeared to fail to earthly eyes, but he did not fail in the eyes of God. He never used his life to satisfy himself. The imperfect attitude of others towards him, ingratitude, unkindness, hostility, misunderstanding, these things did not alter his perfect attitude toward them. He was never lacking in peace, never lacking in courage. There was no self-pity or despondency only peaceful resignation and trust in his Father. Dear friends, you and I must do the same as we strive to be faithful disciples of the Master and to measure success as he did. 
to do God's will in all things, and not only where we foresee success. This is self-giving. This is the self-forgetfulness of Jesus Christ. Our purpose in life is not determined by earthly standards of accomplishment, not by achieving applause and the approval of human respect. Our lives have been given to us by God for the transformation of our hearts, not for pursuing our own ideas of excellence or success. We cooperate with grace to further the kingdom of God, even if we appear to be thwarted, even if it seems as though those closest to us are resisting. Perhaps we can say it like this. Things are wrong not when I can have, when I, let me say it again. Things are wrong, not when I cannot have my way, but when God cannot have his way with me. Can I say that one more time? Yes. Please write this down. <laughs> it's not original to me. Things are wrong, not when I cannot have my way, but things are wrong when God cannot have his way with me. We are not meant to conform others or events to our will, noble though those goals may be, but rather to be shaped by God's providence in keeping with his will for us. If we achieve great things, but then are not conformed to Christ, then we failed. The good God intends that life would purify us, not gratify us. God's purpose is to fill our souls with his life and his grace that we will show our fidelity to his will. Death to self is painful, and it is very hard. But only through surrender to Christ will we find the meaning and the peace and the joy for which we have been made and for which we long. Utility, usefulness, efficiency, Worldly applause, these are not the standards of the divine standards of success. We need courage to face disappointments. But we also need courage not to listen to the voice of the old man, as St. Paul Paul calls him, the unregenerate man, the natural man, for whom self-love is such a secure and desirable shelter. Our enemies are fear of failure and of humiliation. And these things will impede the soul's commitment to sacrifice, to sacrifice itself for God. Each day, we pick up the cross anew with courage, intent on doing what is right, striving to succeed, but not making success the condition of our efforts. Doing something because it is God's will, not because it will flatter our egos. That's the path to the transformation of heart. It is the path that Jesus walked. The letter to the Hebrews again, having set, having having joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Let us think about for a moment the encounter of our Lord with the rich young man. We know that story very well. And to frame it, from the beginnings of John's Gospel, some of us are old enough to remember when the prologue was read at the end of every Mass. Monsignor Esif and I can remember that, but some of you are too young, like Father Scalia, he wouldn't remember that. (laughs) He came unto his own, and his own family did not welcome him. That's the good speed translation. Very bold, the idea of the incarnate God coming home into this world, but I think it really does capture what happened. He came to his own, and his own family would not receive him. That was the experience of God himself. And the question then becomes, how do we see the failures of Jesus. How do we see his disappointment? In St. Mark's account of the rich young man, there is a line there, very important for us, not found in the other renditions. 
It says, Jesus looked on him with love. The literal translation is, Jesus looked on him and conceived a love for him in his heart. Do you know, and I'm happy to be corrected if I am wrong, that there are very few people that the gospel tells us that Jesus loves in this way. We know he loves all of us. We're quite confident of that. But this gospel t- tells us very few people specifically that he loves. St. John the Beloved Apostle, Mary and Martha and Lazarus also, he loves them. And the only other person that I think the gospel says that Jesus loves in this explicit way is the, is the rich young man. A man who had just disappointed him. How much we want to influence the people that we love. It's a natural and good inclination. Those who are closest to us, especially by the bonds of filial affection and familial love and in the order of charity, these are the people that we want to influence in a good way, are they not? Of course they are. And we want to be like the Lord when he encountered the rich young man. The man wasn't perfect, but our Lord didn't dwell on his imperfections. He looked into that man's heart. He saw what was good, and he tried to build it and said, strive higher for this perfection. But it's also true that even as we desire to influence the people who are closest to us, we can be tortured by the very same desire. Do you know what I mean? You parents know exactly what I mean. The people that we love, the people who we want to come to Christ, to see the truth and embrace it, sons and daughters, spouses, friends, others, other family members, we desire for them to respond. They don't seem to respond, or plainly, they are not responding. And now we are tortured by that desire to want to influence them for good things. We must find refuge and strength in the experience of Christ. That's first. Didn't Jesus say before he went into Jerusalem, if only you had known what would bring you peace? This is one of only two occasions in the gospel where the words Jesus wept are recorded. The other, of course, is at the death of his good friend Lazarus. Here was the cry of the heart. So much disappointment. So much sadness. Because those closest to him, he came into his own and his own family would not welcome him. And we can hear the cry of his heart. We try to find and locate our disappointment in his disappointment. Most of all, because when a soul or a will has set itself against God, that is an offense against God. And that is the first reason why we want to find it troubling because God has not been honored. But even as we seek the consolation and the strength from Christ's own example, let us do something else too. Let us console him. Let us go to him in his disappointment. Let us try to bring our love to him in his sadness and pain. Yes, we are to seek refuge in that pierced, and broken sacred heart because we know that that sacred heart was pierced for our offenses and we know that that heart was open to us in such divine charity. But even as we seek refuge there, let us console the sacred heart of Jesus. Let us bring our love to him as he suffers the pain of our infidelity. Sometimes we have the sense that our prayers are not being answered. We don't know what happened to the rich young man, but we know the story of St. Anthony, don't we? St. Anthony heard that very story a couple hundred years later, and what did he do? He put everything away, and he became the father of Western monasticism. So things will happen in time according to God's providence. And sometimes we may find that our influence may be more effective when it is indirect. 
I know that's a very difficult for, thing for me as a former Marine to say because I tend to want to go right at the barricades. That's not always the best way to get things done. It is through that indirect approach, through patience and persevering. Let our fidelity, our own personal example, and our willingness to suffer be a beacon that our Lord can use in whatever way he wishes. It may not be for the ones that we intend immediately, but it may within God's providence be for someone else. Finally, you and I each have a kind of nature or temperament that we have been given by God. And let's face it, we will be agreeable to some and less so to others. And that's nothing to worry about. Of course, we should purify huh, that which is not good. I'm not saying that we should just give free reign to our behavior and say, well, that's just the way I am. No. But we have different temperaments, we have different personalities, and we need to purify what is selfish and be true to the gifts that God has given to us. And we will be more naturally agreeable and vessels of grace the more we purify our hearts for some than for others. God is not calling us through the gospel to do violence to the personality that he's given to us. That doesn't make any sense. But we have to purify that personality and character of that which is not of him. And the more we purify, and the more we are faithful to his will, and that will inevitably come through the purification of the cross, the more effective instruments we will be in his hands. Some final words. You remember perhaps one of the stories of the life of St. Martin of Tours. Something or someone appeared to him that appeared to be the good God and wanted St. Martin to believe that it was indeed the resurrected Christ. But St. Martin looked for something in particular <coughs> excuse me, that he didn't see in what appeared to be the figure of the glorified Christ. What was missing? the wounds. He knew that when he looked and saw that those wounds were not present, that that was not Jesus Christ. In our Lord's glorified body, those wounds will always be present. They are a reminder to us of the efficacy of his suffering and of ours. We have to search out those wounds and know that it is through those wounds that hearts will be brought to Christ. Through a broken heart, may Jesus Christ enter in. Whose words are those? Not necessarily of a canonized saint, but of Oscar Wilde. Through a broken heart, may Jesus Christ enter in. Sometimes we tell ourselves that the opposition of sinners of the world makes us incapable of doing God's work. And so we have the temptation to give up the struggle. But this is to deceive ourselves. What is a first concern is not the work God may do through us, but the Christ-like heart he wants to shape in us. God is more interested in us than he is in our work. That work serves as a means <clears throat> rather than we as a means to work. If we are faithful to his will, then we will be, according to God's providence, most effective instruments in his hands for the furthering of his kingdom, for the extension of the reign of Jesus Christ, in the souls of all. Thank you. My friends, thank you, please.
It is in the context of those remarks that I pay honor to our dear founding director, Father John Harvey, because in many ways it would appear as though to some his life was a failure. And even the real failures that he did encounter in the opposition amongst the family, Matthew 10, 36, and a man's foes will be of his own household. Even that seeming failure was not a final word because what Father Harvey gave to us most of all was not his work, but his Christ-like heart. And because he cooperated so beautifully with God's grace and because he didn't become resentful or bitter in his disappointment, he was such a shining example. It is only on the other side of the veil that we are going to see just how luminous his example really was in bringing hearts to Christ. I thank you for uh, your prayers and for your attention and for the time and effort that you have invested in our conference in these few days. I pray especially that they will be a source of grace in your life and in the lives of those to whom you are an example. Each day when I elevate the, chas the, the chalice at the Holy Mass, I have a deliberate intention for the work of courage. And although I cannot remember each of you by name in that moment because the rubrics won't permit it, <laughs> know that it is my intention to include all of you in that elevation of the chalice. This has been a marvelous couple of days. Ecce quam bonum. Hmm? How marvelous it is when brothers live in unity. Yes? And so we have this great grace of the time together to fortify each other. I, I like Father Fitzgibbons, uh, Dr. Fitzgibbons. He's very fatherly. <laughs> Referring to that, the book of Proverbs, how brothers are strongholds, huh? How together we are united in Christ to be a stronghold for the truth, for love, for joy and peace. And that, of course, is the purpose of the National Conference. So now, go forth in joy and love and peace and take the graces that you have and bring them to each other.